Good morning, Austin. Thank you. We're calling to order Commission Meeting 282 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission on Thursday, November 21st, 2019 at 10 a.m. at our offices here at 101 Federal Street in Boston. We will start with item two, Commissioner Stebbins, approval of our minutes. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in your packet, you have the meeting minutes from the November 7th meeting down in Plainville. I would move their approval again, always subject to any immaterial corrections or typographical errors. Any edits, questions? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? 5 0, Todd. Thank you. Moving on to item number three, our administration, administrative update from uh, Executive Director Berjosian, please. Thanks. Great. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Uh, got a number of items for you. Uh, first, I want to tell you about some recent meetings that have happened since our last uh, open meeting at which both staff and commissioners attended. So I'll just give the highlights then. If commissioners want to fill them later, they can. Uh, the GPAC, Gaming Policy Advisory Committee, met on Tuesday, November 12th up at the State House. Uh, in a, uh, among the items they discussed was a sports uh, gambling update from our own Associate General Counsel, Justin Stempak, administrative update on the region of uh, status of Region C, and uh, racing was also done, and uh, John uh, did a update on the Community Mitigation Fund. John Ziemba, our mm -hmm. ombudsman, did that. So, uh, and the chair was there, so she um, can say a little more later if she uh, thinks that was not enough. Um, we had also had another uh, meeting of the Public Health um, Trust Fund Executive Committee, which was literally in this in this space right here, and that was this past Monday at two o'clock. Um, they received the same presentation that you received uh, previously on the uh, Boston uh, Chinatown study. They also got a gap analysis. Um, on gaming treatment services gap analysis from the folks at Cambridge Health Alliance. Um, and they had a DPH communications campaign presentation, and they have some standing items that they address at, at all their meetings. So, and I know a couple commissioners, one was um, on and one was in attendance. Uh, in addition, uh, both Region B and Region A local community mitigation meetings happened uh, this past Tuesday and Wednesday, Commissioner Stebbins was present. A lot of our staff was present. Uh, the Region B was out in Pioneer Valley Planning Commission out in Springfield, and the Region A was here. Um, I attended uh, a bit of the Region A and would say there were some very um, robust discussions about the, the guidelines for next year, but I don't want to steal uh, uh, John Joe Thunder for the next meeting in front of Commissioner, Commissioner Stebbins Thunder. Uh, but those were meetings that have happened since our subcommittee meetings that have happened since our last public meeting. Okay, so other things that have happened um, uh, last Friday the 15th, as we do every 15th, we published a gross gaming revenue for the previous month. Um, I've been reminded that I still owe you, and I will work with John Ziemba on this, um, a letter to the legislature just um, reminding them both about our uh, uh, bill for racing and the statutory deadline now. So I will get that done. I apologize, but I, I've been reminded about that. I will get that done. Um, let's see. Uh, next week, because of the holidays, I think we may move agenda setting from Wednesday morning to Tuesday afternoon, if that works for everyone, so we can get that done. Uh, in appropriate time and give people, because we'll also probably lose some people prepar preparing for the public meeting afterwards, and it gives a little more of what I call a runway. So I think we're good, and we will obviously post that in compliance with the open meeting law. So, okay. Um, speaking of next week, next week is the last week of harness racing at Plain Ridge Park Casino, and um, they will be racing, they actually race today, tomorrow, and then next week, they'll be racing Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And a little bit of trivia, next week is the only Wednesday race of the season, um, obviously because of the holiday. Um, but it's the only race of the season. So, uh, Excuse me. You gave us the answer, though. 
Well, I didn't. Okay, I'll, then, then I'll, I have I have another trivia question for you oh. that I will do later okay. on. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so, um, uh, you know, I I want to thank our staff. Uh, we have a really dedicated seasonal staff, and those folks. You know, if you look at the racing schedule, it starts in April, four o'clock races. This number of days. It transitions later in the year to two o'clock races. Sometimes they're on Sundays, sometimes they're, so we have an incredible seasonal staff and full-time staff who work, you know, in snow and rain and mud and all sorts of, all sorts of weather and conditions and do just a great job. So we are very, very fortunate for that. Um, so uh, just a big, a big shout out to them and thank you very much. Um, so, okay, speaking of trivia, uh, tomorrow is what? Tomorrow. What about Friday? Tomorrow is... Eight years ago tomorrow. Uh, damn. Yes. The law the was gaming passed. act was passed. Eight years ago There you tomorrow. go. Okay. All right. Damn. We should have That's had that. That's it. Uh, but of course, because of our ethics rules, I have no prize. No prize. No prize. No prize. <laughs> so yeah. that is it. So... <laughs> Um, Thank just you. a quick question on one of your notes, the, sure. uh, the racing letter that you mentioned. Uh, you know, we should give some thought to, and I, I thought we had talked about maybe having it on the agenda for the next meeting and being a letter that the five of us sure. can sign off on. Yep. Um, not that your signature doesn't carry a lot of weight. Only on uh, a check. Um, but uh, I think it I think it helps remind folks how closely Absolutely. we're watching this. Yeah, we'll put we'll get one that we can put in the packet for uh, the next meeting. I think it's still timely enough that if we get it done by the next meeting, it'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you know, beginning of December with the reminder of the deadline would be helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is all. Unless anyone has any other questions. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So moving on now to item number four, uh, we have Mr. Delaney today, our construction project oversight manager, leading the ombudsman's report. Starting with, um, we're just flipping our agenda a little bit. Our um, uh, folks from Encore Boston Harbor are here, and the MGM will follow once they arrive. Hopefully, safe, safely. A little bit of black ice today, so. Good. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. Um, I'm pinch hitting for John Ziemba today. Uh, he sends his apologies for not being able to be here. Um, as you mentioned, we have two items on the agenda, uh, the MGM Springfield and the Encore Boston Harbor uh, third quarter report. Um, so first up is Encore uh, Boston Harbor's quarterly report. Uh, this is their first report now dealing solely with operations. Um, uh, so a little new format uh, for, for this report from what they what you've seen in the past, which dealt mostly with construction. Um, we have with us today Brian Gulbrands, president of Encore Boston Harbor, uh, Jackie Crum, senior vice president and general counsel, and Eric Krauss, uh, senior vice president for communications and public affairs. Um, for this report, um, there was certain information uh, regarding vendor spend that wasn't available when we went to press for the, uh, um, you know, for the packets. Um, so Encore will be providing us with some supplementary information regarding uh, vendor spend. Uh, there'll be some discussion about it today, but uh, we'll get that and, and present that at a later meeting. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Brian and the Encore team for their presentation. And Brian, before we get started, we want to uh, welcome you. Congratulations on your new position. This is your first time here as president, so congratulations from, I think I can say from all of us, yep, and welcome. also Eric, welcome. We um, thank you and look forward to your continuing reporting uh, in terms of the quarterly reports. They're always very, very helpful and um, continuing a, a, a very healthy regulatory relationship, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if I could just ask uh, Brian and Eric to uh, introduce themselves and give a little bit of their background information, as this is the first time that they're appearing uh, at this, in this context. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, Chair and Commissioners, good morning. Good morning. And morning. thank you for allowing us to be here. And thank you for greeting me. And thank you for welcoming in, me in. Uh, just a little bit of background. I've been on this project, whether you're aware or not, since uh, we broke ground. I've been here for a little over two and a half years. 
Uh, my original role here was to oversee operations, so I came in as Executive Vice President of Operations. I've been with the company in 11 and a half years, so nine years uh, in Wynn and Encore in Las Vegas, running non-gaming hotel operations there, resort operations, and uh, four weeks in the job, uh, and we've got our hands full. So we've got quite a bit to do, and we're gonna report today on some of the changes that we're making and the direction that we're taking, and looking forward to working with you and making sure that everything's in line the way it should be. So thank you very much, Good. and I'll turn it over. Thank you, Brian, and thank you for the warm welcome, Chair, and in the commission. Um, I'm Eric Krauss. I do not have the illustrious tenure at uh, the company as Brian. I'm two weeks old, and um, but I've been in the Boston community for quite some time. Started my career as a reporter at the Boston Herald, and I was chief communications officer for the Gillette Company, and then I left. I took Tyco Healthcare Public and created Covidian in Mansfield, Massachusetts, and then was chief communication officer for both Bacardi and Hamilton Bermuda, and then back here in Massachusetts um, for Clean Harbors before joining uh, Encore Boston Harbor. I was chairman of the Board of Selectmen for six years in Walpole, Massachusetts, where my wife and I still reside. But I am absolutely thrilled uh, to join Encore and help progress what we're trying to do, both internally, but most importantly, externally, and continue to work with the communities, continue to work with the municipalities, and then obviously with Jackie, with all bodies that are external. So I'm thrilled, and thank you for having us today. Welcome. Welcome. So uh, we're gonna start with the gaming revenue and taxes. Uh, I know you've already reported out, and we've reported out publicly, um, just to kind of run you through where we've been and where we are and where we're going. Uh, we successfully opened our facility uh, back in June 23rd. Uh, we're now focused on stabilizing our operations and really refining and growing our business. Um, as you can see, uh, 48 million, 52 million, 48 million on gaming revenues, uh, producing 41, a little over 41 million in uh, Massachusetts state taxes. Um, we're at this point really growing our business, and we're, I mentioned some changes. We've had some changes in leadership, some changes in marketing leadership. We've added Eric to the team. Uh, we added Jenny Holiday recently to the team. And we're really listening to our customers right now. It's about making sure that the customers in Boston and in the local areas uh, enjoy our place and feel comfortable in our place, and a lot of the initial barriers that we set up are being taken down. And let me speak to some of those. Uh, we thought we could charge for parking here in Boston, and we, we were wrong. Um, we have now made self-parking free for all, all guests, 24-7. Uh, we thought we could charge for some of the transportation, like boats and premium bus, buses. We were wrong, and we're now making those complimentary or at a very low price. Um, we've also looked at our floor, at our casino floor, our gaming floor, and talked to our customers and listened to our customers. And our demand far outweighed our supply of tables when we opened, and we had $50 minimums. And we were watching social and listening and responding and talking to customers. Now we have $15 tables always, so we value everyone's money. Uh, so we want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to play. We're also in introducing new slot product to the floor. We're rearranging the slot floor to better meet the needs of the customers so they could traverse back and forth easier. But it's really about making sure that our F&B offerings, our room offerings, our non-gaming amenities are meeting the needs of the customers. Uh, the last thing we want to do is be a Vegas casino in Boston. We want to be a Boston casino in Boston. We want to be Greater Boston's hometown casino. And we want everyone to come and feel welcome uh, and feel like they can have a great time there, whether they're playing or not playing. Uh, frankly, we have outstanding restaurants and non-gaming amenities. You don't have to play to come visit us. And we'll talk about some of the events we've done that are non-gaming related that have really, I think, exposed our facility to people that wouldn't normally come to our place. And you've all been out, you've seen the facility. It's actually a nice place to stay and a nice place to hang out, whether you play or not. Um, obviously, our focus is on gaming revenue as well. Uh, but uh, we just wanted to make sure you understood that we are making every effort to grow our business. Uh, something that we also, I think, maybe fell short on when we opened. We launched our red card program, but it wasn't a tiered carded program. 
um, that really we figured, figured out quickly is a requirement. So we will be launching a tier card loyalty program <coughs> January 1st uh, that will give different levels of benefits to different levels of players and customers. And we believe that that, along with some of the promotions and some of the different marketing messaging that we're doing, uh, will help grow the revenues as well as help grow our business and be much more inclusive of everyone, uh, not just uh, the top 10%. We want everyone to come and have fun. So uh, with that, um, I would like to talk about lottery sales, unless there's any questions. Yeah, um, actually, Brian, can, uh, sure. just, just on revenues. Um, of course. A couple of things. Um, I remember um, a, a prior presentation that a, a good early indicator was the rate of signing up into the red card. Mm -hmm. uh, are you still seeing some of those, um, you know, good rates in terms of, you know, what's what's the potential? We are. Signups are still in the thousands as each week progresses. Uh, it has slowed since opening because the majority of uh, the hoopla and excitement was right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, but as we launch our tier carded program, uh, we'll also have a tier match program so that customers that are at the silver level at some other uh, facility will automatically be in the silver level at our, our facility. People that are in the top tier can come and be automatically brought into the top tier. And I think that will incent additional signups. Uh, we've also partnered with a lot of local agencies, um, facilities, uh, we've partnered with the New England Patriots. Uh, we have partnered with the Wang Theater. We have facilities now secured at Fenway, TD Garden, uh, Gillette, uh, the Wang, making sure that we're meeting all the right people and introducing different groups of people to our facility and our business. So we're going to continue to do everything we can to grow that number because that loyalty program does, uh, in fact, drive the business for sure. Great question. One of the other things we heard early on was, you know, kind of wanted to get the bugs out before you really marketed um, internationally. Mm -hmm. um, you didn't mention that. Is that something that uh, will, um, you'll start to do more frequently? In yes, the absolutely. Um, we have a, a very significant VIP business in our other facilities, and we have built this facility to take care of those customers. Uh, the few that we have brought in, uh, I don't want to say prematurely, but on the early side of uh, our business, have been blown away. Um, I do believe our staff is at the level they need to be now, and I do believe it's the right time to start bringing in our international customers and our higher end customers. Um, I hope that you all have the opportunity to come out. Uh, I haven't seen any of you recently, uh, but at opening, uh, when you start with 4,700 brand new people that are all learning their jobs in a brand new facility, it could be a little challenging, and uh, for some of us it was quite challenging. We're now at a place where we've stabilized and are continuing to refine now, and I think we're at that place where we can start bringing in international clientele. But great question, and yes, it will definitely impact our business. Thank you. Yes. I, I appreciated the context uh, of your theme about listening to the customer mm -hmm. and how that is driving some pretty proactive changes. Uh, I would just suggest on uh, you know, some of the changes you made to parking and transportation, I think, uh, understanding the marketplace or at least uh, an expectation in the marketplace um, when you open, but I also think some of those things that you were doing were also driving people to get out of their car and look at the additional modes of transportation to be able to, to access the casino <laughs> without driving their car slowly. So. Uh, so as you've made those changes, I think it's great and I think it's timely because people have gotten somewhat accustomed to getting to Encore Boston Harbor so through some of the other transportation options. They've all figured it out. Focused on, right? And we're going to help, help the ones that haven't figured it out yet figure it out. And I think uh, by lowering those barriers, cost and price, uh, people go, well, maybe I will jump on that boat if it's free. Uh, yep. And it's an amazing arrival experience, so why wouldn't you? You don't have to sit in any traffic. Any other questions on could, revenues? Could you just um, update us on uh, the convention business? I know that there's, sure. when you had startup, there were challenges of getting that in. Are you able to? Mm -hmm. uh, so the business is growing. Uh, our prospects and uh, definites are growing on the books. Um, but we were slow at the beginning. Um, this is a business that books 
nine, 12, 18 months out, you don't decide you're gonna have a meeting for 400 people tomorrow or even next week or next month. Although there is some short-term business that's usually smaller, the larger groups and convention business has a much longer booking window. Mm -hmm. So we're really seeing great activity for 20 and 21, um, and that's starting to materialize now. Um, and we're adding to the sales team. So it, it's important that we have all the horsepower we need in sales, uh, but we certainly have the facility. The team is doing a, a, an outstanding job, so we're really looking forward to that. On the short-term business, though, uh, we have a great facility for catering and holiday parties, and that's just exploding right now. Uh, so really excited about the short-term opportunities, but um, to, your, to your point on convention, it's really a long-term play, and it's a 12 to 18-month booking window that we're working on right now. We just had a beautiful wedding there <laughs> last weekend. So. Yeah. so social events and different things that are happening, and, and we'll touch upon some of that later in the presentation. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Um, with respect to the lottery sales, uh, we started a little slow at 100,000. But in August, we went to 241,000. Now, that is with the addition of Kino that happened in August up at On Deck Burger Bar, where we offer that. And then September, 186,000. We continue to work with the state lottery to make sure that uh, we're maximizing their sales and that we're refining the processes with Kino, which we've made some adjustments there and making it easier for customers to see the numbers. And we're displaying them now on very large TVs. So it's much easier to play, much easier to see the results. and. Uh, we look forward to continuing that relationship. And we've uh, committed to a quarterly meeting with the lottery to review the numbers to see which machines are generating uh, what profits and uh, to make adjustments as necessary to continue to grow that business. Great. On the compliance side, uh, we've put in a lot of initiatives since opening designed to keep minors from entering the gaming floor and if they do manage to sneak in to uh, prevent them from gaming and consuming alcohol. Uh, for example, since opening, we've added stanchions so that uh, our customers entering the gaming floor are required to go right past, directly past a security guard. And we've given all of our security guards handheld devices which they can use to verify identification. What we've discovered is the handheld devices aren't wonderful, they're not terribly efficient uh, or accurate. Uh, they tend to result actually in more false negatives. So uh, what we're doing now is looking at whether we can hardwire uh, the Veridox or another company's machines so that we can verify the identification right then and there. Uh, another initiative that we're, we're looking at and implementing immediately is a number of our younger guests have, um, or more youthful looking guests, have complained that they've been um, carded at multiple locations. And while we certainly want to encourage our uh, cocktail servers and our dealers to, to card anyone who appears to be underage, uh, we did want to respect that these guests shouldn't be carded eight or nine times in an evening. So what we've implemented now is a system where they can go to a central location, show their identification, get it verified, get a hand stamp, and that hand stamp will um, demonstrate to whoever else comes into contact with them that they are permitted to be within the gaming floor. Jackie, can I ask you in terms sure. of the minors intercepted gaming, do you have a shortest time period, longest time period median in terms of the time that they were actually gaming? Yeah, I mean, we've been tracking all of that and we've been working very closely with the GEU. Um, most of them are very short term, frankly. Um, we're catching them fairly quickly. It's obviously e easier at the tables than it is at the slot machines. So we're working on trying to get uh, what we call the rovers. We have uh, rovers in every quadrant of the casino who are going through those slot machine areas to try to uh, intercept anyone who, who may have uh, got past our security at the... Do you know what the actual numbers are, though? I don't, but I, I can get that to you. Out, out of that 41, you just talked about the breakdown between people you're catching at the table, people you're catching in the machine. We would hope, you know, there's more that are sliding in somewhere on the slot machine floor and not actually facing a person. Uh, standing behind the table. Um, so out of that 41, you have a sense of folks that you caught at a machine and folks that you caught at a table? We do have a full breakdown of all of that information, which I will supplement this uh, filing with. We'll get that okay. to you this week. Okay. Thank you. you. You may not know the answer to this question either <laughs> then. I'm looking at the five minors that did consume alcohol. Yeah. And if that was a fictitious ID or did they just not get carded? So on these ones, these were uh, people who did not get carded. Mm -hmm. So what we've told our staff is what we're trying to encourage our employees to do is to look at an ID, try to verify it through our Veridox machine. Um, 
to the extent that they do actually check the, the identification, we're trying to not penalize them if they do not check the identification um, or if it's blatantly false. Then they are uh, then they are subject to discipline. But to your point on false uh, fake IDs, it is an issue, obviously, and I know the nightclub deals with that as well. They're they're probably the biggest target of that, um, and it's something that with the right technology, you're a bit better off. So we are looking at different technology as well. Mm -hmm. right, great. Yeah. So so going forward, Joe. Um, Perhaps you can work with Jackie to make sure we have those segmented metrics because that's an important part of the discussion. Thanks. Okay. So on the operating spend, uh, unfortunately we owe you more information on this too. We, uh, we are short one procurement person, so um, unfortunately we weren't able to compile the data uh, in the format that I know Joe and Jill have asked us to do. Um, so. We are working very diligently on this. Uh, we started with a number of companies that we already had contracts with in Las Vegas uh, to maintain sort of the brand image, the brand consistency. So we're looking at those uh, contracts to see what we can pull out and do locally and what needs to have that, um, the, the win branded uh, uh, consistency. So here's just a few examples of some of the local and minority and woman-owned businesses that we have been working with. Uh, these were sourced locally through our procurement team here, and uh, we've entered into long-term contracts with each of these companies. Jackie, I had a chance, I think, to meet the folks from uh, DPV Transportation, and this is obviously a business relationship that's really transforming their company, and they were... Uh, extremely excited about the business opportunity, but at the same time uh, nervous, but at the same time I know uh, Director Griffin actually worked with them in your spending team to get some payment issues worked out, so. Right, and we're continuing to work with them to uh, make sure that it's sustainable for them as well. Good, thank you. May I comment on DPV real quick? These two young guys are fantastic. Uh, minority owners have really done a great job for us, partnered with us well. We didn't see ridership coming from certain locations. They were quick to respond, and we said, let's, let's go to Patriot Place, and let's see what we can do there. They've gone down there. Let's go to this other location, and they've reassigned equipment, redone their operations. Um, they've really been a joy to work with, and uh, they're great partners. So I'm glad you brought them up, because they're two really, and they're young guys. Nothing wrong with being a young guy. Uh, <laughs> but they're doing great, and we look forward to a long-lasting partnership with them. They're great. That's great to hear. Thank you. So uh, on the employment side, we, uh, as of November 12th, had 4,674 employees, uh, and we're continuing to hire. So far this month, we had over 50 new employees go through our uh, two-day orientation, including Eric, so he can give a blow-by-blow blow, blow of that orientation. <laughs> um, uh, as of this morning, we had 68 uh, open job postings in hotel, food and beverage, retail, marketing, customer service, and sales. So uh, we're continuing to recruit and to hire. We also, of course, have our tenants in the building. We've got Big Night Entertainment that run Mystique and Memoir. We've got Fratelli and Dunkin' Donuts, and of course, each of those have their own employees, so that's another few hundred employees uh, from those tenants. In terms of the uh, minority veteran and woman and local uh, breakdown, um, we're very pleased to report on the minority side, we had a goal of 40% and we're actually at 54%. Uh, on veterans, we're meeting our goal at 3%. On women, we need to work a little bit harder and get up from 44% to 50% and that is something that we are focused on. In terms of local hires, which is defined as within uh, 30 miles of the casino, we're at 87% compared to our goal of 75%. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Jackie, I, I lost track. Did you, did did I hear you say that the goals, because of what you were expecting, did you just say them and I missed, I missed the Sure, goal. so on the minorities, we had a goal of 40%. 40, I couldn't hear that, I'm sorry. Uh-huh. Veteran was 3%. Three, okay. Uh, woman was 50. Mm -hmm. And local, 75. Jackie, you may not uh, 
be able to answer this because uh, it's probably on the HR side of the house, but um, it's timely because as we think about workforce pilot training programs in the next round of community mitigation funds, are there uh, challenges that keep coming up in terms of skills or training that you find good candidates? So I, I think what's, we do a lot of training in-house and we can, okay. we can train uh, people who come from uh, different industries, from restaurants. A lot, of our, um, a lot of our food and beverage are people who come from restaurants, not other hotels. Uh, I think the biggest challenge we're having is we're a 24-hour operation, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people aren't used to working a night shift. Uh, we are also pretty uh, strict in terms of our work rules. So we, have, we expect people to show up. Right. Um, we expect them to show up in a timely manner. Uh, and if they don't, we have a progressive disciplinary process. And I think that given the unemployment rate in the current market, and a lot of these uh, employees have come from sort of more local restaurants, they weren't uh, accustomed to the uh, sort of rigidity, rigidity, rigidity rig <laughs> rig of our, of our uh, process. And so I think that's taken a lot of adjustment. We are starting to see that. Um, level out, um, and we're fairly pleased with our attrition rate right now. So, okay. you know, we're, we're in the 20s, the high 20s attrition rate, which is what, less, frankly, than where we thought we'd be. Um, and so our employees are definitely learning our system as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned skill set. <laughs> I, would, I would say we still uh, would love to have more dealers. Um, we are continuing with Cambridge College and our partnership and our dealer school. Um, so that is uh, one of those uh, at least for the near future, we'll continue to do that um, until we feel like we're fully ramped up in the casino side. Um, you're aware we've added tables because of demand, mm -hmm. and so as we add tables times three shifts, uh, you need more staff. Right. And so, and our, our business is really peaking on weekends, obviously, uh, and evenings. So it's, it's more difficult to staff everybody on two days and then have uh, a more level playing field uh, the rest of the time. So. Um, I think dealers will be one of those focuses we have for quite some time because there aren't a lot of Bostonians that have a tremendous amount, a tremendous amount of experience in dealing. Mm -hmm. So we're helping on that side and certainly uh, recruiting from everywhere. Okay. And dealers need to be 21? Uh, we are yeah. acquiring 21. And 20, okay. correct. <clears throat> and with respect to Cambridge College and yeah. uh, Deborah Jackson is lovely as president. I. Um, I'm wondering in terms of the pipeline, are they getting, attracting the students that they need? Is there any promotion, advertising issues for them? Uh, so, and is it a, a positive pipeline for you? In other words, are you able to hire a high percentage of their graduates? Yeah, it's still an effective uh, operation for us. Uh, certainly we could always have more. Um, and I, I don't have visibility to exactly the recruiting methods. Uh, so I can get back to you on that with more information. I'm just wondering, I want to make sure that uh, the pipeline yes, is, of is healthy on both ends. Yeah, the know. pipeline has been very healthy. In fact, we've had a waiting list of people. So as we open up new programs, we send out to those people and let them know that we're starting a new program. And oh. so we've been very, very pleased with the, uh, and, the participation. And then in terms of the graduate, uh, who you're able to hire? Uh, open, over 95 percent. Oh, not 95 percent. And then in terms of scholarships, you're not finding a financial barrier so much in terms of the program? Uh, we haven't, uh, we obviously gave out a lot of scholarships at the very beginning. Um, we haven't heard any issues with finished. scholarships, I'm just, but. I'm turning to, um, uh, in terms Sorry. of our community um, mitigation too, that you're not hearing that financial barriers are keeping students out. I know that we are hearing that out in the western region. I'm not, I'm not so much sure about eastern region okay great thank you that's really helpful and just one more thing to add so as we've sort of stabilized now that we've been open for a little bit um, we're able to we've been able to implement our leadership programs and so HR is rolling that out so now we're able to take the managers who've been running at a million miles every day and actually give them the training that they need to be better managers and to grow in their positions too and I think one of the important things that we're focusing particularly on the diversity side is making sure that we get women and minorities through those leadership programs and into the um, higher roles that are available. I suspect that my fellow commissioners will be asking for those numbers, so. Um, I, I suspect as much. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, along, along those same lines, um, 
because you did such a such a, um, a very good job with the construction phase in incorporating women, mm -hmm. um, have you identified any barriers to your overall hiring or specific job uh, jobs that women may need to be encouraged to you know they they can do those jobs, or have you? I mean that's an important step. I know you said you're working on that. Um, but identifying barriers is, is a critical piece. I just wondered if you had any, any um, statistics on, on those things. Uh, we have um, identified certain departments that have less women in those departments. And what we're trying to do, uh, much like we did on the construction side, um, for example, uh, what we call PAD, which is our public area cleaning crew, anything outside of the rooms, uh, so, you know, housekeepers, we have a large percentage of women, but we're not seeing those same candidates apply for our PAD positions. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do is if we don't have a housekeeping position available, we're trying to talk uh, the candidates through what we do have available in PAD, ho hoping to transition them into a role which they wouldn't traditionally think that they may be able to handle. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the other department that we're working very closely uh, with to make sure that we get more women in is our security department, which is a really large department. Um, and uh, Rich Pryor, our uh, director of security, has, has done a really great job in the last few months of really identifying uh, women that um, are, are meet the criteria to work within the security department or how we can adjust our criteria slightly so that we get people in who can be trained. Thank you. Jackie, again, kind of staying on this topic, uh, any update on the, uh, the daycare services? Yes. Okay. So, very good. <laughs> yes. I know. Yeah. Um, Sorry. So, great that came news. from Commissioner O'Brien through me. <laughs> Excellent news. We actually got our certificate of occupancy on the daycare center last week. We have moved in all the furniture. In fact, uh, my assistant, Anusha, has spent the last two weeks mm -hmm. uh, at the daycare center helping them move the furniture in. Um, so now they're going through their process of trying to get everything done on, on ABCs, ABC, ABCD, ABC, ABC, on their end uh, to make sure that they can get up and running uh, first thing uh, in the new year. Uh, moving on to marketing and entertainment. Uh, Brian, do you want to take us through this? Sure. Uh, so we had July, August, September. Uh, quite a few different promotions and ramped them up uh, sequentially. So July was really a launch of the Red Card program, which is our current program. That will morph into something different uh, the end of December, launching on the 1st of January, as I mentioned. Uh, that went out with a lot of free credit and got everybody excited and brought people in. And it's about trial and acquisition and making sure that customers can come and players can come and try us out. Uh, in August and September, it started to become much more promotional and we had our first car giveaway. It was a 2019 McLaren, which is a nice fancy car. And a resident from Melrose actually won. You can see him in the bottom right corner, very excited with his Fenway shirt on, <laughs> winning a $220,000 sports car. So he was very excited. This is after he did a race back from Mike's Roast Beef. This is hilarious. So I you had to be present to win. Hand. A friend of his texts him and says, hey, they just called your name. You're the winner. And he says, nah. And they, it's just another friend called him. He's running down Broadway from Mike's Roast Beef to get there just in time to claim the prize. So we were very excited to hold the car for him. Um, he, time he, he, all within the rules, yes. Doesn't he have the sandwich in his hand right there? Uh, <laughs> that would not be the sandwich. I think that's, <laughs> no. that's the prize. I think he dropped no, the, the sandwich prize on the way. The other yeah. Hand. Yeah. But, How uh, much time did he have to get back? How fast can it he was, run? It was 15 minutes from oh, calling the name. Like that, yeah. yeah. But that's, that's quite a run. Yeah. So. But I think it should be duly noted that he was taking advantage of a neighborhood enterprise to grab Absolutely. his sandwich, that's right. one that's well known. Mike does a great job. impact of the cottage industry. That's right. That's right. Um, many different promotions, but the car promotion so successful that we did a second one uh, in October, also very successful with a Porsche. Um, but we'll continue that on a regular cadence. Uh, and we're really introducing quite a few additional promotions and different things that we'll report out next month or next quarter. Um, and you'll see this grow more and more to be more competitive in the market. Um, we also, if you turn the page, had a few uh, concerts. And we started doing special events to really drive incremental uh, traffic and introduce our facility to different 
customers. Tony Bennett, uh, a true icon, he was phenomenal. Um, really did a great show. Uh, show was sold out. We had uh, invited guests there. Uh, they all came in and then uh, scooted into the casino and had a great time. We changed the music that night in the casino, so it was a lot of fun. Um, we had Casey and the Sunshine Band, yes. Uh, some of us still remember Casey and the Sunshine Band. Uh, <laughs> it was a great night for everyone. And then we had Earth, Wind, and Fire. Uh, uh, when we kicked off things, we've had Paul Anka. We've had some Asian concerts. We had a Vietnamese concert. We had a Taiwanese concert, uh, making sure that everybody has uh, something to enjoy and bringing in different groups of people. So it's been a lot of fun. Uh, we've learned that boxing is very popular here in Boston, in the greater Boston area. We've had two uh, Friday night fights, uh, championship pro boxing, uh, both uh, with Murphy's Boxing, and both were very well attended. Um, and the evening went very smoothly. Uh, we had extra security and we had extra police detail just in case because everybody gets excited at a fight and there's a certain activity going on in the middle of the room that would in, might inspire people. We had no issues. Everybody was very civil and had a great time, but there was a lot of hooting and hollering, so it was a fun night. Um, the next page, a little different than fight night, we had our first high tea. Uh, this was really for the LGBTQT plus community, and the event was on a wonderful Saturday afternoon. As you can see by the pictures, it was uh, beautiful weather and everything was still green and glowing, but we had a great reception we had a couple thousand people show up, uh, not all with that in community, but with residents, with customers that are just walking by, hearing the music and the DJs going, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, we all got to kind of go down. I hung out, and uh, it was a really enjoyable afternoon, uh, so much so um, that the LGBTQT plus community here in Boston wants to have additional events with us, and we're talking to them now about what we're going to do next to up it even more and make sure that uh, we're the right facility for all. So it was a lot of fun. And I did not know, I have to tell you a quick, quick story. It's high tea, and that's what we build it as. And about a half hour before the gates open and before the opening, I saw six uh, ladies, probably in their 50s or 60s, and they were beautifully dressed with beautiful tea hats and their pumps waiting, and I, and I asked them, if I could assist them, and they said, we're here for afternoon tea. And I, I explained. Now, let me, let me fit forward real quickly. An hour later, they were on the floor. They had the best afternoon tea and afternoon they've ever had, and it was really something that was to be seen and enjoyed by all. So it was a wonderful afternoon. Um, mentioned uh, briefly earlier that we've secured suites uh, for all of our guests at Fenway, Gillette, TD Garden, The Wang, and we're also very proud to announce um, our partnership with the New England Patriots. Uh, we are now the official hotel of the New England Patriots for several years to come. Uh, what a great organization, um, and have recently met with some of the other uh, sporting as associations and organizations here, uh, really making sure that we have the right strategic partnerships here in the community and that we reach out to all. Uh, but all of the venues have been very supportive and welcoming, so it's been great. And our guests are certainly enjoying all of our winning teams. I think any questions on any of the promotions or any of the marketing that we're doing, you will see us uh, come out more strongly with uh, Boston's hometown casino. And again, we want to be Boston's casino, not a Las Vegas casino in Boston. Um, and we certainly welcome any input that you have as well. Uh, we want to make sure that this is a partnership and we move forward and grow our business uh, for the benefit of all. So thank you. On our community relations, we, uh, we engaged in a few cleanups, a cleanup of Jordan Boys and Girls Club of Boston and Stone Zoo. And we also had about 110 participants in the um, 5K run uh, that benefits disabled veterans. Um, in other community highlights, we are proud to announce that we are the gold winner of the Massachusetts Economic Impact Award, which we will be receiving on Monday. Uh, it was actually a pretty amazing competition. We went in and had to pitch. There were about five other businesses from eastern Massachusetts in that room. And there were pharmaceutical companies that have developed drugs that are really saving lives. Um, there, there were uh, 
uh, there was a company that can track every s social media post. So in real time, they track Twitter, Facebook, everything, and they're able to give a company real-time information about what's trending right now and uh, how to respond to it. And there was a sustainable farming project, so a pretty diverse group of companies that, that uh, were participating in this. And we were really surprised and shocked and pleased to be the winner. Um, to date this year, we've donated 2.5 million to local charitable organizations, and our employees have, have volunteered 4,200 hours. Our goal for this year is 5,000, and we're on track to getting there. I wanted to turn it over to Eric just briefly to talk about uh, community relations going sure. forward. And well, we, we have the ten year, we have the four-year commitment of ten million dollars for tracking well with a quarter of that in year one. I think what you're going to see from Encore Boston Harbor going forward is no matter how much we're going to give, it's never enough, and we want to probably transition of trying to do a lot that then you don't give as much and you don't have the impact with a single organization. So I think we're gonna go from a, a shotgun approach to much more of a strategic focus in areas that are important, not only in our host community in Everett, but in greater Boston as well. So you'll see at least the commitment of our money remaining, but where we channel that uh, will probably change in some cases dramatically. Uh, employee volunteer hours, we are committed to hitting the 5,000 threshold, and um, our employee base uh, in all the companies that I have worked in is probably stronger here than anywhere on being in the community. But we have ongoing meetings with Boston and the surrounding communities on what's important to them, and we're gonna continue to do that. As you may know, we partnered with the Connors Family Office, and um, they have been terrific in identifying where we go. We have implemented a new committee internally that the three of us sit on, so any dollar going out needs our approval. And uh, hey, we're four months into this, and we're only gonna refine it and get it better. Great. So any questions for us? Um, well, maybe just a comment. I, um, there's a lot of great signs and, and um, um, substance to the report uh, today. Thank you. Um, I would just um, I look forward to future uh, updates, especially um, uh, on the table game play. Uh, it's, it's good to hear that you're reacting quickly to what you perceive to be uh, higher demand than anticipated uh, on table. I know that carries uh, a number of logistics, uh, not just additional hiring, uh, but you know, in, in instances there's slot moves and, and uh, perhaps camera coverage. Um, so it's really good to hear that, uh, that you're responding uh, quickly. Um, as, as everybody knows, um, we, do, uh, we will do research on patrons, a patron survey and other things. Um, and we'll be, I'll be interested in seeing how much of that market is being recapture money um, and you know, that, that's leaving the state, uh, how much of it might be just the market dynamics that you're in because you're competing with other uh, Massachusetts licensees, uh, and how much is the overall market really uh, growing, which is something that we're also interested in, in ascertaining. But um, thank you for the report. Uh, just on that, I, I'd like to say thank you to Bruce and Burke and Lewis because we've been doing these changes almost constantly and they have been unbelievable to work with. They've been responsive, they've been helpful, they've, uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't thank them enough for, for being so prompt in their response. Good to hear. Good to hear. Yeah. Good to hear. I have a, a couple of questions. Um, on employment, uh, you know, thank you so much for uh, the provision of both full-time and part-time. I know that you're going to get back to us on uh, really looking at the minority breakdown and the goals a little bit in further detail. But <clears throat> as you know, this is a, an, um, the measure of number of employees is an important one for the community. Right now, the combination of full-time and part-time is 4,674. We know that you started with a high number, I think it was maybe like 5,800. 
for the for uh, really your opening. Mm -hmm. Jackie, you were here, I believe. I was not um, when there was a submission for your application. Do you remember the number of what you uh, anticipated for employee number? Off the top of my head, <laughs> Joe said he's got it right here. Mm -hmm. uh, it was significantly lower in our application. I believe we were at 3,800. Joe, you want to correct me? Uh, the, um, let me see if I can find it. John just sent this out to me uh, yesterday. I think it was 4,300 and change was the number. I think it was, was in the RFA, too. Yeah, and, 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 I, yes. and I think that's an important yeah. number to have um, on the record. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, uh, <clears throat> I believe that you are keeping track of local taxes. I've seen one article. Again, I think that's a really important measure. We recognize our licensees as economic drivers. So do you have off the top of your head any numbers that you want to share, or could we at least plan on that coming in the future sure. in terms of hotel and meal taxes? So we actually had a meeting with the uh, city of Everett on Tuesday, and uh, we're working to get that information. They get it on a quarterly basis. We obviously know how much we paid in, but we're trying also not just to see what we paid in, but what, um, but what it, it, the impact on other businesses within the community. They did have one. They only have one other hotel uh, in Everett. It's uh, the Envision Hotel, lovely hotel. Um, and so we're trying to trying to break it down and see are we helping the Envision? Are we helping Mike's Roast Beef? Are we helping some of the other uh, restaurants, McDonald's, uh, right. down the street from us? And so we will be able to report on that and give you that information as soon as we can amalgamate it all from uh, with the city of Everett. That 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 would be a really helpful metric. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would I would echo that. And you know, certainly it's something we've had a conversation with, you know, Mark Vanderlin and our research team about to look at some of those local trends and those local revenue sources and seeing what kind of impact we're having. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank and you. Again, Thank welcome. You. We, uh, we knew you were already here in the Boston area, so we don't have to say welcome to the neighborhood, but thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Okay, so next up we have um, MGM Springfield. Um, we're joined by Mike Mathis, uh, president of MGM Springfield, and Mike has quite a crew with him, so I'll, I'll step aside here and he can uh, introduce the, uh, his, his folks for their quarterly report. Don't go too far, Joe. No, I'll be right back. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Mathis. Good morning. How was your trip? Icy or not so icy? Not too bad. Good. Do you want to introduce your team, Mike? Uh, Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Michael morning. Mathis with MGM Springfield. Uh, I think it might make sense to let them introduce themselves as they, uh, they report out on their respective sections. Um, and apologize for the delay. And I want to thank the Encore folks for switching up the order. So, and congratulations to them for, for a great opening quarter. Um, it's interesting to hear some of their, their growing pains, their growing pains that I'm sure are familiar to you because we've reported on the same items. Um, obviously, we had the benefit of, of a long history of regional operations, so we got ahead of some of those issues just by nature of those operations, but we're learning as well, as you know, so, um, so wish them all the luck. Uh, do I have the clicker? I do. <clears throat> so I think some of this we touched on last quarter because, because the lag effect, we're always in, we're always in uh, we've got new information even as we're reporting on prior quarters, but just a refresher on our one-year anniversary. Uh, I think for us, especially in this uh, third quarter, the one-year anniversary is significant because we're lapping ourselves. And as we lap ourselves, we're able to really um, take a look at the things that we saw in the market in that month and the kinds of changes we've made to, to track our progress against those prior months. 
still you get a little bit of that opening effect um, from those first two or three months. So for us, I think the real, um, the real year over year comparisons will become more meaningful the farther you get away from that, that, new, that new shiny toy opening impact that both us and Encore enjoyed in those first two or three months. But that said, uh, had a great one year anniversary. Um, we talked about in the past, celebrated not just the community, but really our employees as well. And just to remind you, one of the, one of the great experiences, bottom right photo is um, a f our floor supervisor, uh, Mike <coughs> Davis in table games. And he had worked the night before until about 4 a.m. He was part of a pool of 200 employees. We had made a commitment at our um, grand opening with our employees that anybody who had perfect attendance at the, call it the, the supervisor and below level, the hourly level, would be entered into a pool to win a car. And incredibly, we had 200 um, individuals that qualified for the raffle. And Mike Davis, who had worked um, until 4 a.m. the night before, his boss asked him to come out to volunteer <coughs> to support the grand opening event. Uh, we were a little concerned he was going to tell us to pound sand, having worked till 4 a.m., which would have been awkward. But he was a trooper. He came out, and uh, we're, myself and Jim Murray, our chairman, awarded him a car. He's a Springfield resident as well, so really, really great story. Awesome. Good story. Uh, just to highlight a few changes, and you know, we continue to, uh, to tweak and evolve <coughs> our program. Uh, the photo there is our stadium gaming, which we opened about uh, right around the anniversary. Uh, and it's been a huge success. I think one of the things that we've learned uh, about the market is that you've got to uh, provide different um, products that, uh, for a high frequency customer and give them an opportunity to engage in, uh, with, the, with the product in a different way. What the stadium gaming does for us, is a few things. One is it allows us to give them a, a lower table limit. You heard the Encore folks talking about dropping from 50 to, to 15. We had the same experience, dropping from 50 and 25 down to 15. We're now getting requests for 10 and 5. And um, because of the stadium gaming, which is staffed by two dealers who are able to basically serve a 24-seat uh, table, if you think about it, uh, we're able to provide uh, a $5 um, table limit because of the efficiencies on the labor. And they're able to play multiple games as well. So been a great product, very communal, and uh, we continue to expand that, um, look at expanding those opportunities. Mike, how is the market, you know, your customers responding to that um, stadium gaming? Uh, very well. It's, uh, it was tracking above, you know, we call it the house average on the machines. And uh, we've got one more uh, game that we've added to the four screens that are available. So, you know, it's always interesting about these uh, machines as well as, as we track average bet. And it's the perception of choice that people want. They want a five minute, five dollar minimum, but I think our, our average on those machines are somewhere in the fifteen dollar per um, per bet. So it's it's, it's 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 working quite well. It's been very profitable for us, and the customers love it. Because they're really multitasking, right? They could switch between one game and another. That's right. Rather quickly. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, you're able to play roulette and blackjack at the same time, and there's a there's a customer that wants that that uh, opportunity. That opportunity. Uh, this has been a really uh, a great opportunity for us. We, we just this past uh, weekend uh, opened our VIP lounge off the hotel lobby. And in terms of lessons learned, uh, we thought we, we could get away with not offering a VIP lounge. Um, and our customers told us uh, that they really wanted one. And uh, we converted the old Starbucks space off the hotel, which was underperforming. We're trying to understand a little bit more why. We think a lot of it is location. Uh, but into this really beautiful space. And it really gets, gives uh, a chance for our, our VIP customers to get away from sort of the, st the stimuli of the casino floor and to get some quiet space, especially with their family, their spouses, um, in, in a nice, beautiful space. And you can see it's done as well as we've done the rest of the property. And I think some of you have toured it. And i um, very excited about it. We had, we op we had a grand opening. Um, event for this this past weekend and had 600 or so VIP customers um, in that space and then spilled out into the lobby. <laughs> but really great feedback about, you know, most of it was directed at me and was it like about time you gave us this. So, uh, but great space. I had, a, I had a chance to be in there the other day for your reception with the uh, officials from the surrounding communities. And they were impressed. I was impressed. It looked, it looked great. Thank you. 
It looks great. What, what are those uh, things uh, that appear to be hanging on that third picture, Mike, from the ceiling? Yeah, they're, they're uh, in keeping with the theme that is throughout our property, especially in our hotel lobby, they're, uh, they're hardbound books that have been opened up and uh -huh. splayed open and the pages have been curled over. And um, it's, it's, it's a very neat installation. And we've gotten a lot of comments about that, that particular uh, chandelier. That's great. Looks like MGM is having a direct impact on the Brimfield flea market. That's, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. We will try to track that, uh, now that you mentioned it. <laughs> um, and then, uh, you know, some of the things that are under uh, development. Uh, we had our uh, groundbreaking uh, about a month ago for Wahlburgers, about a month and a half ago. And uh, construction permitting is underway with the city. That is a, a June, July planned opening. That was the last piece of our development, you know, in, on the campus, uh, as you re will recall. Uh, that will bring uh, between 25 and 50 jobs based on the estimates we've received from the Wahlberger family. And it's gonna be uh, their first Wahlbergers in this side of the state. And I think you know, part of what we're trying to do is, is obviously bridge the gap between Western Mass and Eastern Mass. And I think bringing a brand and, and with the Wahlberger name out there, they wanna be very active in promoting it. Um, it's an important location for them. And uh, I think they recently announced a, w a Worcester location as well. So clearly, they're invested in trying to build um, build a brand across the Commonwealth. And we're excited to partner with them. And then, really, uh, this is we're on the heels. I think about two weeks ago, uh, Madam Chair was out for a, an incredibly exciting uh, announcement, which is we are bringing the uh, Red Sox Winter Weekend uh, to Springfield. It's been in uh, with a Connecticut competitor. Uh, who also had the Green Monster branding opportunity. And when we took over the Green Monster as MGM, part of that agreement was to also bring Winter Weekend to Springfield. So Sam Kennedy, the president of, of the Red Sox, came out, brought the trophies, um, and it's going to be the third week of January, and this is part of a long-term uh, relationship. So uh, tickets went on sale. I, I get um, periodic counts on how that, um, how that event is selling, but they estimate it could be as many as 10,000 a rabid uh, Red Sox uh, fans coming to downtown Springfield in the third week of January. Um, incredibly exciting. It, it's going to be a game changer for the region. And if you talk about economic impact, there, you know, that, that is more people than we can feed, certainly more people than we can lodge. And the, uh, the hotel blocks reach all the way out to Worcester. Uh, the restaurants are gearing up. We've met with our CVB to get ready for this, for this group of folks to come out. It's a two, three day experience. We're going to um, have a bunch of activation around it. Um, interestingly enough, that same weekend is also the Hoop Hall Classic, which is one of the uh, nation's top <coughs> amateur uh, high school basketball um, showcases. Happens to be the same weekend. It's sponsored by the Basketball Hall of Fame. Uh, Dwayne Wade and LeBron James's oh. sons are playing in that showcase. Oh, wow. So there's the opportunity potentially for, for those folks to be in town at the same time as the Red Sox. So it's going to be one of the bigger events that side of the state scene since probably our opening. Um, so we're very excited about it and all the opportunities that that will bring. Is that a three-day weekend? Is that Martin Luther King It weekend? is. That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, so it's a, it's a great weekend. And we, we're work, we meet weekly with the Red Sox folks to make sure that the whole city is ready. You know, we call this a citywide. In, in Vegas, you have citywides. This is going to be more than a citywide. This will be a regionwide because of the impact. Mm. That's a great opportunity to showcase your facility, to showcase Springfield and all the area. So we, um, we know that it's a, a very much a joint regional effort. And I think that if we were guessing when eight years ago when the Expanded Gaming Act was put into place, they were imagining exactly that for the region. So mm -hmm. good luck. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and in that sort of regard, the um, in that vein, we've, uh, we've got another really exciting opportunity later in the year. It's the uh, Basketball Hall of Fame NBA enshrinement. Uh, we hold it every year uh, in, at Symphony Hall. And this particular year, the class includes uh, Kobe Bryant, Tim Duncan, Kevin Garnett. This is going to be a tremendous year, probably the biggest year since uh, the Dream Team went in. 
So again, imagine both of these events in downtown Springfield in the same year, and it will be the same type of preparation, and it will be really more than a citywide, it will be a region-wide. Region so we're, we're very excited about 2020 and uh, exposing a lot of new visitors, customers to downtown Springfield, uh, the MGM Resorts, obviously, product, but really, um, really the region. So very excited about that. Uh, I'm just going to close on this section, uh, Madam Chair. You, uh, you asked the Encore folks about local tax impact. I know I mentioned the impact and, and what was a great um, business development uh, event that um, Commissioner Stebbins put on uh, a week ago and uh, introducing all the licensees to different businesses, which I thought was great. I'm, I'm getting a lot of emails from that and a lot of activity, so I appreciate the introductions. But I did a deeper dive, and at this point, we can compare fiscal year uh, 18 to fiscal year 19. So July of um, 2017 to June of 2018, what the city collected in meals and occupancy tax compared to the period of uh, July of 18 to June of 19. And i um, very proud of the results. I think for many, for, many uh, for the few naysayers that talked about uh, the, our licensees being cannibalistic of the local economy, um, if they were right, then you would expect to see our MGM revenues offset by declines in the other, and those numbers would be flat, right, if that, would, if that were to prove their case. That's not the case. We, we, we said that, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. We believe that. We, we size our campus such that uh, visitors would spill out of our four corners and go into the local restaurants and go into the local hotels. So here are the numbers uh, from fiscal year 18. The city tracked 2.9 million in um, combined occupancy and meals tax. In fiscal year 19, that number jumped, and it only had 11 months of our impact, by the way, right? Because that started in July. 3.8 million is what that number, that is a 30% increase, $887,000 of increased economic activity. You hear anecdotes about our businesses is our, you know, our local business is feeling the impact of MGM. It's been great. Our business is down. It's hard to, un, hard to sort of siph siphon through some of that um, anecdotal information. To me, the data s speaks volumes. Um, we estimate we're probably 50% of that increase because we're obviously pushing a lot of meals through. We're pushing a lot of occupancy through at a higher ADR, which impacts that tax rate. But the other 50% is pure lift to the remaining businesses in the community. And that's something we'll continue to track, but we're incredibly proud of that, and, and as well as uh, you should be. That's great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Mike. Yeah. Appreciate it. Very yeah, good, thanks for urging news. me to, to track it down. I know that was something that you uh, reached out about. Uh, at this point, talk about revenue, taxes, and lottery, and then we'll switch over to compliance. Um, so you can see our, uh, our quarterly gaming revenue. You know, we are settling in. We're not certainly not, um, not satisfied with it, but we're settling in in that low 20 million sort of um, monthly gaming revenue. For me, I think what's meaningful about this is these are the first three months uh, with Encore in the market. A very formidable um, competitor, certainly, and they've done a wonderful job. And, and in terms of a month over month comparison, I don't have the Q2 numbers, but I know these, these numbers represent Flat to, we're flat to up over the Q2 period. And that, and that substantiates for us that we have a very strong local market. We have a market that appreciates the MGM product. We certainly have some great Boston customers, and we've seen them come back after trialing Encore, and they've told us that it's a great experience, but it's a different experience, and we like the MGM experience um, just as much as we like the Encore experience, but for different reasons. So we're gonna share some of those great customers S certainly, some of the great Springfield customers in the Western Mass are going to we're going to share with Encore as well. But uh, we've we've been able to absorb that the introduction of, of that um, that strong competitor. And in fact, as um, we're sitting here today, October numbers have been already been released. We're in the middle of November. We're seeing a very strong uh, fourth quarter, and I think that speaks to uh, us getting into our database, making the improvements like the the VIP lounge and some of our marketing changes. So uh, I think the future is bright, and um, we can coexist in a really, hopefully, vibrant Commonwealth market. Mike, just in general, um, the same comment that I had for, uh, for the 
the, the people uh, from Ancor. As we move forward, and I do, we do more uh, more of this research. I'd be interested in just how much you think you're growing collectively the the market, and how much might be um, your success in trying to recapture some of that play that was leading the state before you came in. Sure, uh, you know we're we're always a little sensitive about some of the proprietary yes. analytics that we do, but I think you know one way just as you think about the size of the market is what we look at is. Uh, if you define the market as, as the Commonwealth licensees, certainly the Connecticut, the two Connecticut operators, depending on how you feel about um, upstate New York, we sometimes include Schenectady, the rivers um, folks in there. Mm -hmm. And then you look at Rhode Island, the Twin River and Tiverton operations, um, all their numbers are public. So you, you, put that all into, uh, you put that all into a table and uh, whatever the increased revenue that you're seeing from the new operators, you look at what the decline is in the other competitors. And when we came on board, certainly uh, you saw a little bit of a, a decline in some of our competitors, but our new revenue far outweighed the declines. I think you're seeing with, uh, with the introduction of Encore that we're not only not down, but we're up. So you can see what maybe the declines are in some of the other competitors, maybe outside of the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. but. Um, the introduction of MGM, the intro introduction of Encore is growing the market in a whole. There's a little bit of cannibalization, but there's new customers coming and they're spending, and there's existing com customers that are coming that are spending more time and more money in these facilities. So we believe, the, we, believe uh, we are growing the market significantly. Thank you. Uh, the lottery uh, performance, I, I think, uh, you know, these, these look s in some ways similar to uh, what you saw in Encore. Uh, obviously, they had a very large August, as did we. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we're excited about the lottery opportunity. Part of it, it really goes to how we, uh, we incent our customers with uh, different promotions. And some of our better promotions have been around lottery ticket giveaways. So what these numbers don't speak to are the lottery tickets we actually buy ourselves as a customer. I think these are just the terminals. Uh, but we're, we, we believe we, we've got a robust business. Uh, we're going to continue to promote the lottery in our, in, our, in our different customer promotions to drive a little bit of more awareness to the terminals. But it's a pretty healthy business, and I think it's performing quite well. Um, for whatever it's worth, um, you know, whether they do or don't, I believe um, playing, which does include whatever, you know, in their lottery reports, whatever they might purchase for giveaway. For okay. It's worth. We'll, we'll, we'll look at that. Uh, I didn't I mean, believe we were, but perhaps, perhaps we are tracking them in these numbers. And, and I think that's why I asked last, at our last commission meeting, whether mm -hmm. or not it, um, they had Kino, because it, there's a suggestion here that it's the lottery tickets. Now, see, I see Kino. Is it just from the machines that you think, or does this would this reflect Kino as well? It would. It, it would include Kino, which I think we generally um, provide in the tap sports bar. Okay, so this definitely is not just the Pats. It's mm -hmm. in Kino as well. Yeah, I believe so. But I'll make sure between that question and then our own purchases. And then your own purchases. I'll, That'll I'll, be. I'll verify for the next report. And, and Joe, if we could just make sure that all, th you know, PPC and Encore, everyone's measuring the same way. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, it's a, it's it's an impact, right? A positive impact. If you're purchasing them to give away, the lottery still sold that ticket. That's right. That's right. Well, and then the good news is that the numbers show great sales yep. uh, for the lottery. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. At this point, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Daniel Miller, our Director of Compliance, to talk through our, uh, our Q3 numbers for, uh, on the compliance side. Thank you, Mike. Good morning, Lady Chair and, and Commissioners. As Good you morning. said, Daniel Miller. I know we met briefly in the last uh, quarterly meeting, but so I'm the new Compliance Director, took over from Karen McRae. Um, and yeah, I'll happily walk you through uh, our, our numbers regarding the uh, underage, uh, you know, participants, sadly, either on the casino floor, gaming, uh, or uh, consuming any alcohol. Um, I, I, I like July, uh, even though the first number seems pretty high, uh, 
again, it, it speaks to how we're detecting and, and quickly removing uh, these people from the gaming floor. Um, and I don't know if you remember, but from uh, the last quarter's uh, response as well, June was pretty high, July appears high, August appears high. We interpret those as being directly related to school being out, college being out, and opportunists, as it were, between probably the ages of 18 and 21 trying to get uh, onto the, the gaming floor, and, and we're finding them. Um, but in, in the month of July, we had no table games uh, gaming, and we had no alcohol consumption by any minors either. Um, so that we, we felt that was some very good numbers there. Um, regarding August and September, uh, there were a, a little bit of both on that front. There was one table game uh, player in August, and then the three uh, consumptions of alcohol. One of them was the table game player as well. Um, and then there were two and two in September. In, in all but one of those cases, they were, to your point earlier, um, Commissioner Cameron, uh, fake IDs were used in that case. Uh, one particular situation in August uh, was someone in the poker room. Uh, they were questioned. The ID was shown to GEU, and even they couldn't tell at first whether it was or was not uh, a, a fake ID um, to its degree. But uh, Are you using some of the technology, the verification technology? And now, next. Okay. <laughs> as, of, as of September, late September, um, in this particular slide, you can see uh, the security officer standing behind that podium. We have three brand new podiums at the main entrances to the gaming area, and each one of them now has a Veridox system uh, where they're scanning, uh, at the very least, anyone that they feel is under the age of 30, so it might be questionable. Um, and then when we go into our checkpoint uh, program where we shut down to just one entrance uh, at night, they're checking everybody for ID at that point. Um, and what I, I either can or cannot give, because it's actually cute for, uh, is as of October, we've managed to prevent six people from getting on the casino floor uh, because of going through that checkpoint um, and their IDs running as, as being fake or bad, which were then turned over GEU and they confiscated those, those uh, fake IDs. So um, it, it's sometimes difficult to see through the numbers themselves. But I think we're doing pretty good overall. So I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked Anko <coughs> earlier, which is do you have um, either a shortest and longest period of time before interception on the floor and or a median before? You said you quickly removed them, but I'm just curious what the timing is. I, I don't have specifically with me now, um, but what we're seeing when it comes to, say, someone that sneaks between two slot machines and gets into a slot machine type area is, is a range somewhere between three and ten minutes is the average that they're found, picked up, and removed from the gaming floor. Do you know what the longest was? Did you um, have anybody who managed to evade for an extended period of time? I think there might have been one in there from memory that was maybe like 35, 40 minutes, something like that. Um, that's about all I can think of that didn't have fake IDs, you know. Um, mm. So uh, some of them were, man were able to stay out a bit longer because they offered these up and people checked them thinking they were good because mm -hmm. um, they were already on the floor. But. Um, yeah, I think that's probably one of the only numbers that stick, sticks out in my memory right now. So we could get that for you. Okay. Uh, yeah, Commissioner O'Brien, I, I, I look at the same number because, you know, we have such a porous floor, as you know, and, and on the slot machine side, it's, there's going to be incidents, but it's how long w were they able to stay there? And I'm, I'm always, I marvel, we'll get you the numbers, but I marvel at how many of them are four minutes, three minutes, five minutes. Um, you do once in a while see a 30 minute and you try to figure out what corner was that that mm -hmm. abated our rovers. But the one thing I'll say about these numbers is they come as a result of an incredible focus by our team. And I want to recognize the 130 security officers that um, second to making the place safe, this is their 1A priority. Uh, we, have, we have really focused on this. The, the one table game incident, and we're, we're shooting for zero tolerance. We had one in this quarter. Um, was unfortunately a, a parent who bought in on our big wheel and allowed their daughter to bet. I mean, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's really unfortunate the kind, of, um, the kind of behavior we're seeing from parents, and we're seeing that to, even on the slot machines. Um, so just know that the one is unacceptable, at that, but that was the circumstances around the one. Otherwise, we would have had a flawless um, quarter in terms of the table game piece. Mm -hmm. Mike, some of the changes that you made to the floor, the, the, the new bar, the stadium, gaming, kind of was in that back corner where might have been a better place to hide. That's think, right. Do you think clearing out that space, making it more visible, is going to maybe drive some of these numbers down a little bit? 
I, I think it has, and the other point there is that that's one of the areas that we've installed one of these podiums, so we now have dedicated security on the entrance from the salon area that's there on Main Street. Right. Uh, there's one as you come in from the hotel lobby, um, 24 hours a day, and then ultimately the one from the valley, which is where we get most of our uh, entrance and exit foot traffic. So. Thank you. And this redesign of the podium, which we introduced to you at prior quarter, I think has made a big difference. It, no one can walk by and not recognize that this is a perimeter. Hmm. And um, it, it's, it's made a big difference, and we continue to try to tweak it. The Veridox is another great addition <coughs> to those podiums. Uh, that's everything I have for you, unless you have any other questions, Commissioners. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Yeah. At this point, we're going to hand it over to uh, Ryan Gurry, our Director of Financial Operations, to talk about um, our spend. Thanks, Mike. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Nice Good to morning. see you again. Um, I'll briefly go over our uh, diversity spend uh, for Q3, and then I'll get into local. A um, couple of highlights. This quarter, uh, biddable spend is is up uh, 3.1 million quarter over quarter. Um, you can see we have 12.5 million in biddable spend for the quarter, and um, we're beginning to kind of climb that ladder um, for the WBE spend. We're, we have a slight uptick quarter over quarter, um, as well as with MBE, which has been uh, one of our you know, areas that, we, that have been a challenge uh, historically so far. Um, so we have a slight uptick there as well um, with a, an increase of uh, just about $75,000 quarter over quarter in that category. Um, VBE, uh, slight downtick, although um, that downtick is, is really, in terms of spend, uh, very insignificant. It's, a, it's about $1,000. Um, there's really only two vendors in that category right now. Again, we're trying to grow that. Um, but the main uh, supplier in that category is, um, is supplying all of our disposable for food and beverage for our inventory. Um, so that kind of ebbs and flows with, with that business. Any questions on diversity spend before I move forward? Uh, I mean, I would just note, and I think you hit on it, and I'm happy to see that you're focused on it and aware of it, but you know the MBE numbers are pretty disappointing. Right. So whatever we can do to re-engage our stakeholders to see how we can help you out. Most definitely. Uh, we continue to uh, sponsor the GNE MSDC. Uh, we hosted their their expo this quarter, which I'm going to cover in a later slide um, at MGM Springfield. Uh, it was a great event. I think um, you guys attended. Um, we we actually ended up meeting some MBE suppliers there that we're, we're now doing business with. Um, so it's, it's an area we can continue to focus on. Um, we, we're really, you know, continuing to do outreach every quarter. Um, and, you know, we're just, it's challenging to find, you know, suppliers that are in the pipeline um, that, are, that are registered right now. So um, as we find them, you know, we're, we're certainly giving them opportunities. Um, and we're just we're partnering with with our certification partners to to really try and build that pipeline. Mm -hmm. So, if if you haven't met him, Nate Acevedo is here from the Hispanic American Institute. You might want to introduce yourself before you leave. Definitely. You know, on on, on that note, do we? Um, this is a part that uh, you know shifting between uh, licensees would be a positive. Uh, do we have um, a list, uh, Jill, of everybody that is licensed or have to, has done business with any of the licensees um, that is also a certified MBWBE um, to share with others that, uh, you know, if they're doing business in any side of the state, um, they could potentially do it elsewhere. Maybe we can follow up on that. Thank you. So I nod. So Thank yeah. you. Thank you. All right, moving on to uh, local spend. So uh, a couple of highlights this quarter. Um, we did have um, an increase of $3.2 million quarter over quarter for, um, for our, our total spend. Um, and we continue to maintain um, our commitment to, to local spend in uh, more than 50%. So th that's a 1.25% 1, 1 increase quarter over quarter. Of, of spend with Massachusetts suppliers. So that's that 9.4 million you see at the bottom. Um, and, and 
it, which I'm even more excited about is uh, the next number, which is um, the Western Mass spend. So uh, $7.7 .7 million in payments to Western Mass, uh, which is a, uh, a major uptick of 9.6% um, quarter over quarter in Western Mass. And that is um, largely driven by uh, Springfield spend and uh, largely driven by uh, suppliers that we are doing business with for capital improvements across the property. So as you hear you know, Mike talk about the new VIP lounge, uh, I think we've, we've already talked about um, the new casino bar. Um, those are projects that we're leveraging and continuing to leverage uh, local suppliers uh, to, to execute on. All right, I have a special guest speaker with me today um, to talk a little bit more about um, the supplier diversity program uh, with MGM International and also with MGM Springfield. Uh, her name is Rebecca Marigian. She is the uh, owner and president of Park Cleaners, one of the oldest full service dry cleaning uh, companies in the state. And uh, she currently supports our, um, our dry cleaning at the property. And she's been with us since pre-opening, I believe. Um, and uh, she is uh, one of the suppliers enrolled in our uh, corporate uh, supplier mentorship program. So she's been working with uh, some people, um, not only in Kenyatta Lewis's office and our supplier diversity office, um, but um, with some of the partners that we have um, through that program. So um, I brought her here today to talk a little bit about her experience, uh, give it some history on, on her company and, and kind of how it's going with MGM Springfield. Good morning to the committee. Good morning. Good morning. Thank Welcome. you for having me. Welcome. My name is Rebecca, and I'm from Park Cleaners in Springfield, Massachusetts. We've been around since 1935. It's been in the, uh, my, the Tukorian family, which is my family, the entire time. Um, through the more recent history of my company, it has been uh, a struggle. And um, Basically, it was just a dream <laughs> to be sitting here right now today about four years ago. So um, we're very proud to be part of this project. Could you just tell us a little bit how business has improved with this, uh, with working with MGM? Our sales have doubled. Doubled? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've been able to hire uh, 10 employees from our Forest Park neighborhood, uh, which has been great. I think that's my favorite part, actually, is when working with the community. Um, the mentorship program that I have been introduced to has been an incredible help in, for the process of growing the company. Um, we've always been, you know, just kind of sustaining. So now to be growing is a kind of a new thing for me. So to have the support of MGM is, um, will, I think, will ensure the success of my company, hopefully for another 84 years. <laughs> Great. Can you uh, say the total number of your employees? I have 14. So you went from four to 14. Yeah. I can't do that math that quickly, but that's <laughs> <laughs> significant. Um, so that's excellent. And are you a WBE? I am um, registering, I'm in the process right now of the certification for the state. That's what I was um, going to ask. I am on a federal level. I think I w did it accidentally in the beginning and I registered uh, on a federal level, um, which in turn gave me a Department of Defense contract, which is also very helpful to the company. So the accident <laughs> actually helped, worked in my favor, which was good. <laughs> so maybe this is actually really helpful because one of our questions often is, is how does a, a company uh, become certified? So you're going through the process with OSD right now, is that right, in the state? The, the state, the WBE to the state, yeah. The WBE, and you're just starting, so you, I finished the application process. It was actually um, easier the second time around. <laughs> so I was, I was able to complete the process in about 30 days. So right now I'm just waiting for the response. Yeah. So the good news is that you've gone through the process. It's a little bit easier than you may have expected mm -hmm. and you're waiting. 
Oh, yeah. good. Um, yeah. There are partners in the state we want to make sure that there's not too much friction there so that we don't ever discourage Actually, I was, I was very impressed with the process. Yeah. Excellent. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. I know that there's been a lot of work done on it. So you're finding it to be not overwhelming. Not at all. I was very nervous about it in the beginning because it took me a long time to get certified in the, in the beginning, um, you know, running the business and trying to, to meet the requirements. Was, was a challenge for me. It took me almost a year <laughs> to get certified. So, um, for the federal. For the federal, yeah. yeah. And then um, it, it, when I started the process, I was amazed at how quickly it, it took me. It was very, very simple. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. And Rebecca, can you, uh, can you just talk a little bit more, or, or uh, the people from MGM, about the mentorship program that you uh, quickly mentioned? The mentorship program is wonderful. It provides me a pathway to get questions answered, you know, for the growth of my business. Um, you know, I don't want to make the wrong decisions. I could easily, you know, go out of business by buying, you know, the wrong equipment or um, making a bad decision. So to have the support of, of this company is, um, is assuring to me to, to be able to make the proper steps. So it's MGM who provides that uh, yeah. mentorship? Yeah, so, so Rebecca and, and Park have, um, have been in the program, I think, since January of this year, you guys started. So um, I think the first step, we um, connected them with a Cycle of Success Institute, and they did a full SWOT analysis, right? Um, and through that process, they, did, they mapped out business processes, they identified I believe is up to 50 items and categorized them and, and did a, uh, an analysis on that to really prioritize um, what the team wanted to focus on to, to grow the business. Um, I think one of the things was like SOPs and yeah. what else did you guys focus on? Um, the training for the people really because it's, it's such an employee based industry that I have so getting everyone to work. Um, to the proper standards every single day, seven days a week, was my biggest challenge. And we were able to get that under control with um, the Cycle of Success in Institute. So it, it impressed me 100%. <laughs> um, and, and since then, um, we've got her uh, partnered with an executive sponsor in uh, Anthony Caratazzolo, our um, VP of Hospitality. So. Um, you guys have been, you've met once, I think you're, you're meeting again soon. So um, anytime there's any questions or um, continued uh, support that's needed, um, Rebecca has a, a, a point of contact on our executive committee um, that she can go directly to. Um, and then there's, I think you, you said, you mentioned some online courses too. Yes, um, I'm taking a class right now, thanks to MGM, um, Fundamentals of, of Business management and what that's doing is teaching me kind of how to structure my business. You know, I'm more of an executive level, which is important because, um, you know, I'm going to be needing help in that area. So it's hard for me to make all the decisions all the time. Right now I'm the president and I'm the vice president and the treasurer and the secretary. So how do I split that up? And this is uh, leading me very well. So it's a, very good. I'm excited about it. It's great to hear. So you're, you're not only um, much larger than you were before, but you're also more efficient, more effective, it sounds like? Much more, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions for Rebecca? No. All right, I'm going to move forward. Thank you for coming Thank in and talking to us. Thank, Thank you for having me. All right, last but not least, uh, just a recap of our outreach for Q3. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we hosted the GNE MSDC Annual Expo at MGM Springfield. It was a two-day event. Um, we had um, a, a great event, uh, great turnout. There was a, a luncheon, supplier expo. Um, there was a, a Bears Den competition, which is a little bit like a, um, uh, a shark tank. Um, that they did live, which was which was very interesting. We got to hear from some um, some dynamic companies that they all made pitches, and at the end, one of them received the Bears Den Award. Um, 
and um, Kenyatta Lewis was also on hand to uh, to host a uh, a speaking engagement uh, about how to implement a supplier diversity uh, program um, and also sustainability um, at your company. Um, so a lot of the attendees uh, went to that uh, and listened to her speak on that point. Um, and then while she was in town, um, also visited with Rebecca at Park Cleaners, um, a little check-in and uh, got to see all the, the great things that she's doing and, um, and the things that she's implemented uh, at her operation. Uh, and then finally, the local team uh, went to an art craft vendor fair um, in Hadley, Mass. Uh, I believe it was a matchmaking event, so I uh, met some new suppliers uh, in the region and um, really you know, um, tried to continue to build our, our pipeline out here. So. Mm -hmm. That's all I have for today. Any questions? Mm -hmm. No. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioners. Thank you. So at this time, we'll move on to our uh, employment readout with uh, Jason Randall, our Director of Human Resources. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Great, to be, great to see you again. Jump into our numbers. Uh, on, with our progress on our hire, hiring goals, we continue to exceed our goals for Springfield residents, minorities, and, and, and veterans in our staffing numbers, um, with continued focus on growing uh, the number of women um, in our workplace as well. Um, as discussed with um, with the folks from Encore earlier, you know we identify similarities as as they are seeing now in the security realm, um, where we could see increased participation. Um, we've been able to focus some of our recruiting efforts by attending um, focus job fairs, uh, particularly with criminal justice students. Um, most recently at Westfield um, Westfield State University, where where they hosted a criminal justice job fair, and we were able to uh, meet their students and share our story with them. Um, on our next slide here, we have our quarter over quarter numbers. So um, our total employment number as the end of Q3 is 2,040, 73.3% um, of which were full time. Um, and the uh, total number of um, employees of vendors that we saw on property, we saw, saw 108 in Q3, um, in large part uh, an increase quarter over quarter due to the programming that we were able to put on our plaza. Um, to, to support the uh, events that were going on in there. Uh, but you see the, the changes quarter over quarter on this slide. Our J Jason, are those uh, vendors, uh, you know, the food trucks and, and others, uh, the, what you have in the armory? I'm just, <coughs> just, just. Yeah, a little bit of food trucks, but more so supporting the concerts um, yeah. that are on the plaza, the yoga that we're able to bring in, um, these sort of vendors that would uh, we'd have on a weekly basis on, on the plaza. Hey, Commissioner, I think the landscapers and some of the outdoor cleaning and security are included in that I'll as well. That. Yeah. Skip the head. Our Q3 recruitment efforts, uh, we, we love hosting students on, on our, our facility and showing them kind of really what it, what it looks like to work in an environment like ours. Um, we're fortunate to have about 45 students from the University of Massachusetts, their uh, hospitality and tourism program come and tour the campus, um, as well as students in uh, HCC's culinary uh, English as a second language program, um, where they got to see front of house operations, back of house operations, with the culinary students to really see what our kitchens look like and, and meet some of our, our cooks and chefs. and and uh, hear their story a little bit about what they could anticipate in a workplace like ours. Um, we've been able to translate that into interest in positions, you know, um, immediately following tours or following the, the programs as they graduate or complete uh, interest in joining our team. Um, we, we supported HCC's uh, uh, ESOL culinary program with mock interviews, um, providing those candidates with feedback. Um, it was a great opportunity to give them exposure to how our company uh, conducts interviews in um, giving them feedback on their resumes um, in, you know, in, a, in a true fashion and, and letting them know, you know what, if they wouldn't have ordinarily gone past the first stage of interviewing with us, what they could do to improve. So those students were able to embrace it. Um, and, and one who actually came back and was hired by our company you know, following the program. So, so it was good to, to kind of see her journey and give her the feedback that she needed when she was in front of the hiring manager to get the position that she wanted. Um, a bunch of initiatives that we did in Q3, and I want to highlight two that our team is really proud of. We hosted a veterans resource fair 
uh, in July on our campus. We partnered with Veterans Inc. Um, and brought in a variety of resources. Uh, we saw just about 50 um, veterans that came on campus uh, to either explore career opportunities with MGM or to gain uh, support through resources that are available in the region to them. So uh, we, we saw positive comments from members who, who, who of veterans who, who left the event uh, really with no interest in, in maybe joining MGM Springfield, but did get the connections that they needed to perhaps support some medical needs that they had through, uh, that they would get and found resources available to them that they otherwise weren't aware of. So, so positive impact by hosting this event. Um, internally, we launched a, launched a English as a second um, language uh, program for our employees. Uh, we partnered with the Springfield Public Schools who provided us with a, um, a teacher um, and, and our students. We made it available to all of our, our, uh, our employees uh, to come in and it was a, a really an interactive program where the, the, the students could kind of learn at their own pace. Um, and engage with the instructor to, to meet the, the needs that they are experiencing in the workplace to be able to support our guests. Um, very positive feedback and great partnership with the, with the public schools on that program and we'll be uh, launching our next session with that group um, following the new year, uh, again partnering with Springfield Pub uh, Public Schools. On our workforce development initiatives, um, many of these kind of bleed into the in Q4 for us, but um, I do want to highlight a couple that um, we've found great um, uh, uh, positive reaction to. Um, we, we've re-engaged with Westfield Technical Academy, which is a high school uh, school in Westfield, Massachusetts, um, uh, focusing with their, their culinary program. Um, we'll, they'll be on campus with us for a student tour to see our facilities uh, shortly. Um, but our team, our food and beverage team, um, made a donation of uh, of, of uh, hardware to the to their culinary training program that the the s students um, were very appreciative for. Their their uh, school put a Facebook post up that got a lot of traction. Um, a lot of, of of their alumni to the school that like that are uh, like seeing that MGM was interested in their students, knowing that quality students are coming out of that program. Uh, to either enter the workforce or transition into uh, continuing education. So it's a great partnership that we are able to, to re-engage and reinvigorate. And um, um, we've already had our executive chef on campus with the students since our initial kind of re-kickoff with the school to talk to the students. So it's uh, exciting to relaunch that. Um, internally, um, we, we, uh, we, are, are, we launched an employee network group called Inspiring Leaders for our employees who are interested in networking and growing themselves. Um, they wanted a one of their meetings focused solely on resume review and interviewing skills. Um, so a, a few of our leaders came in and we did just that, where we could help our employees where they could improve their resume, uh, but coach them in how they could interview for that next position um, in the brand with us. So it's a great way for, for them to hear from the hiring managers themselves of what they look for and how they could best approach an interview um, that they may be nervous for or, or, or may think they're not uh, as well prepared for. Um, so great feedback for, for our existing employees to, to hear that. Are you tracking those internal promotions? We, we do track our internal yeah. promotions. This group, we- So they understand that they have opportunities. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. It's great stories that we could share with them mm -hmm. of uh, you know, individuals that uh, were reviewing their resume and how they came along through our company and have promoted in various, um, various uh, instances along their journey that they could share the message that you know, you're, you're in at, at the level that you're in now and to prepare yourself for that next opportunity. It, it, could, it could come around the corner tomorrow and, and having your resume and your skill set um, prepared for you to take that journey. It was a great story for them to, to hear. Um, we, we did this resume review last month, so uh, we know a couple of them that are very eager to uh, explore their next step with the company and kind of watching them through their application process and that journey now. Great. Thanks. Pleasure. Um, we did want to spotlight um, a couple of employees that we had. We, we hosted three um, interns in our uh, hospitality internship program, which is a corporate MGM um, internship program primarily housed in Las Vegas, but we wanted to house our own interns here in Springfield. So we had uh, three students that, um, that we accepted into the program and hosted this summer. 
uh, one student from Cornell, one from Westfield State, and one from UMass Amherst. Um, all three completed and graduated the program, and they were uh, situated in disciplines like food and beverage, finance, and casino marketing. And uh, uh, the, the feedback we received from them was their experience was fantastic. Um, we have one who has already applied to our management associate program, so she may be um, heading to Las Vegas upon her graduation from college to do a year-long rotational program uh, to expand her, her career with, with MGM. And uh, lastly, just want to leave, um, share the opportunities that still exist at MGM Springfield. Uh, if you went to our careers page today, we have 50 active uh, postings listed on there. Uh, in total, they would equate to about 150 total heads that we're looking to fill. Um, uh, like Encore shared, we do, we do see a uh, continued need of table game dealers as well. Um, so that, that's probably our heavier uh, single posting position that has a lot of headcount that we're still looking to fill um, for those roles. Uh, Jason, the same question I asked your, your counterparts at Encore. Uh, tight labor market, you know, we hear a lot of the kind of conditions out there that make hiring a challenge. Uh, but as we think about uses of our workforce pilot grants and the next mm -hmm. round of community mitigation funds, uh, what kind of obstacles are you hearing from potential candidates or what are some of the hurdles to get over and trying to find the right people? Certainly, and I, I think as was mentioned before, um, the tuition for the gaming school um, is an obstacle in our region. Um, certainly MCCTI uh, is aware of, the, of that. They do have scholarship programs that, um, that are very focused right now and I, I believe they're looking to you know, expand the uh, scope of, of uh, whom would be scholarship eligible so we could uh, see increased attendance into the program. Um, I think over overall with, uh, with the gaming school, um, uh, there's a lot of marketing and awareness of the school, but I, I don't think our region has quite grasped on onto the career opportunities that exist within that pipeline of, 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 um, of work, of being a table games dealer and kind of where, where your career can go from there. Um, we, uh, MCCTI has uh, uh, recently launched a, an, an initiative with, uh, with uh, SDCC and HCC um, and other community partners to, to share that message further. So we joined them um, earlier this month. Uh, we're able to kind of share the journey of a table games dealer career-wise to about 80 uh, participants that they, that they brought in through uh, various community partner programs uh, to, to hear the message and then uh, be able to um, see what training opportunities would be available to them. Great. Well, thank you, Jason. Uh, I know we're running a little long, so I'll, I'll breeze through some of the other sections because um, you've seen some of this material before. Uh, on the marketing side, you can see our quarter was heavy car driven, uh, same sort of model that Encore has seen as well. Uh, but. I think it's important in to, to keep the, these promotions uh, fresh and unique. So we're, we're, we're doing a, uh, a cash vault um, promotion where you get to punch in a code and potentially open, open a door for a million dollars, uh, which has been wildly successful. Uh, so we continue to, to mix it up. Uh, we're, we're, we're starting to make sure that um, to the extent that there's a perception that there's not enough winners on the floor, I can guarantee you there are many winners on the floor. And, and for customers that are willing to let us promote them, we're, we're, we're getting more active about making sure that people recognize that there's, there's big jackpots won on the casino floor. So just a little bit of our, our, our marketing effort there with largely locals. And then on the entertainment side, you know, uh, unfortunately with the, with the onset of winter, we, we had to close down our wonderful outdoor uh, plaza. Uh, music venue. We did 40 shows as part of the MGM Live. Um, the good news is that's an annual series, so we're going to bring it back again uh, next uh, spring summer. Uh, the the tent is now the the covering is now off the uh, the armory and is now open, uh, getting prepared for our skating rink. So, with one season um, going out, there's a, there's another fun activation out there, and we'll be opening that up uh, I think this weekend, uh, soft opening of the skating rink. But uh, continue to program entertainment, now looking into the 2020 calendar. But a very successful outdoor summer series. 
Mike, are you going to be able to activate the plaza for the winter weekends somehow? Uh, are you, are you, am I asking for No, you? no. You're, uh, we're, we're literally in those conversations with our team and with the Red Sox. So I think we're going to leave the skating rink open um, longer than we normally would have um, for that very reason. Uh, because we, we expect to see a lot of families that that uh, winter weekend that event, so yeah so we are we're in active discussions internally about that great thank you you're welcome and then uh and then just a little bit more of the uh plaza activation we did our first outdoor boxing it sort of reminds me of the old caesar palace days uh, that predates me but when when outdoor boxing was very active and we try to return that to uh to downtown springfield so we had outdoor boxing in our plaza the food trucks have been successful we had the uh, food truck Fridays. Our first three Fridays got rained out, which was incredibly depressing. But uh, we persevered, and um, it was really wonderful. And I think it's becoming, uh, we're getting a nice little following. And then um, our comedy show and, and some of the outdoor activation you can see in the photos. And then on the entertainment side, just uh, more of the same. Uh, We've got obviously the, the wonderful Aerosmith shows. You can see the photo of what the NBA Basketball Hall of Fame enshrinement looks like on the top left. Uh, and then really tapping into our relationships in Vegas. We had Boys to Men come out. Boys to Men are part of our residency out in Vegas. Uh, the uh, Aerosmith is part of our residency out in Las Vegas. So we leverage those relationships. And then a really fun uh, event we had was uh, Steve Martin, Martin Short. And that spoke to a whole different group of people. Um, People that you know, we 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 sort of polled that were were new to the resort. A really wonderful night showcasing Symphony Hall and just trying to keep diverse, fresh entertainment going through the the different venues. And then just give you a sense of the up, uh, the upcoming calendar through the end of the year. Uh, very robust, and uh, what this doesn't show are the. Uh, are all the uh, Thunderbird hockey games that are that are kicked off across the street at Mass Mutual Center, and those are some of our biggest Friday nights, Saturday nights. The the team is doing wonderfully, uh, which has increased um, um, attendance, and we are working with the red uh, with, with the Thunderbirds. We've now got their jerseys for game nights on Friday, where we put uh, we try to put a lot of our employees in the jerseys to really create an experience. So Thunder, you know, really branding the whole facility Thunderbirds on their big game nights. And then going into the first quarter, and more more acts to come. But um, Red, certainly, Red Sox Winter Weekend will dominate the month of January, um, for sure. And then I think close it out with community engagement with Jose uh, Delgado, uh, who is our uh, director of government affairs. All right. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so as Mike said, I'm Jose Delgado, the director of government affairs at MGM Springfield. I'm also a lifelong Springfield resident and uh, proud to be working with, with the company. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention is that MGM Resorts strongly believes that the success of any business starts with the community that we operate in. And for us, from the beginning, we've tried to integrate ourselves into the Springfield region, Western Mass, and throughout the whole state. I think we've done a good job of, of doing that to date. And so one of the things I'm privileged to, to highlight today is some of that community involvement in Q3. Um, it starts with the employees. Um, without the employees, their energy, their excitement, their, their willingness to get involved, we don't have as much of a robust uh, impact in the community. And so I wanted to highlight some of the opportunities that we had in Q3. Um, the first picture you see on the left is some of our folks uh, volunteering in the Springfield Jazz and Roots Festival. Um, it's an annual event that happens right in downtown Springfield, right in the historic Court Square. Um, Great event, a lot of folks coming from around the region, and so we were happy to have some of our employees get involved in that. The middle picture you see is some more of our employees, including myself. I'm the person on the right with the hat on and glasses. Although the picture makes me look a little bit more buff than I, than I think I am. Uh, <laughs> but we were happy to partake in, in kind of celebrating the heritage of the Puerto Rican community in Springfield and that parade, uh, which, was a, which was a great event. Um, and then the third picture you see on the right is a picture of our, of our uh, folks volunteering on the Connecticut River. As many of you know, the resort is located just, uh, just don't throw it away from the Connecticut River, which the city was founded on back in 1636. So we were super uh, excited to support the Connecticut River Conservancy in their efforts to continually uh, keep the river clean and hopefully uh, keep it uh, nice for future generations to come. The last photo you see on the bottom is the Big E. We're happy to, to support the Big E, the, the annual Big New England Fair. 
that happens every September, we actually um, offered a free shuttle service from the property to the Big E that folks were able to, to take a part of and actually park in our garage. As you know, parking is free, so we were able to kind of hopefully help some of the load of traffic going through West Springfield uh, during those few weeks that the, the Big E is on. So. Jose or, or Mike, um, are you satisfied with that sort of volume? Do you think uh, you saw increased volume out of that um, Big E shuttle? in terms of um, patronage of the casino? Uh, short answer is no. Uh, we, we saw good volume, but we just believe with a million and a half people coming through there that there's more opportunities at cross market. So uh, this was a great first step, and we, and we, tracked the, um, we tracked the participation of these free shuttle riders. And if you had a stroller, you were peeling off and going to the garage, which obviously makes a ton of sense. But if you were if you were an adult, you went into the food market, you went into the uh, the casino. So we want to up our, our shuttle runs, but really just figure out um, how to how to engage those customers in a different way. The challenge I think in September is is sort of the last days of summer, and I don't blame folks that want to spend it outdoors versus indoors. Mm -hmm. um, but that's you know those that's um, you know that's really the mission is try to figure out how to how to create a little bit more activation out of that group. And the last piece I wanted to highlight on the volunteer side of things is um, I've been to several of these uh, volunteer events, and the one thing I, I do like about it is that every time I go, we're able to identify um, some of our team members, our employees, who actually are showing leadership skills by, you know, stepping up and actually wanting to be the point person for each one of these volunteer events. And so we're seeing a number of our folks uh, really just showing their leadership skills through these volunteer events, so, which, was, which is great to, uh, to see. So, any more questions on, on that piece? Um, so this next slide here, we're, we're super uh, excited to support um, the Thank an Artist event. This was put on by the Springfield Cultural um, Project. That um, It's a mixture of the City of Springfield, Springfield Cultural Council, Mass Cultural Council, um, and the Springfield Central uh, Cultural District. And this event, uh, we hosted it right on our plaza, and it was able to uh, highlight and celebrate many of the local artists in the Springfield region. Um, and the creative community in Springfield. And, and as you guys know, um, our CEO, Jim Murray, is a huge fan of, of the arts. He's actually an art history major himself. And that's evident through our whole property in terms of some of the collections that we have on display from the Springfield Museum. So we were happy to, to continue that kind of theme there with this event. And some of the pictures that you'll see have students from the community music school kind of showing off you know, the skills that they've learned at the community music school right across the street. So again, another great event that we had um, back in September right on the plaza, we were able to kind of uh, engage that community. So super proud to support that. And then the last slide here, I might be getting a little ahead of ourselves. This technically didn't happen in Q3. It actually happened a few weeks ago, but since we're kind of coming into the holiday season, I thought I'd throw it in there and get everybody some holiday cheer. Um, we hosted the Bright Nights Ball a couple weeks back. And for many of you guys that know the Bright Nights Ball, this is kind of like the premier event for the city of Springfield, or in the city of Springfield. Um, this goes to support the spirit of Springfield that has their annual calendar of events that they do throughout the year, which includes Bright Nights through Forest Park, includes the uh, big, uh, big balloon parade, big, excuse me, parade of big balloons, and the uh, world's largest pancake, just to name a few. And so this event was chaired uh, by Congressman Richard Neal, who's the chair of Ways and Means, and uh, CEO uh, of Mass Mutual, Roger Crandall. And so they were able to raise funds that night to support a lot of those events that many folks in the region get to enjoy. So another event that we were proud to, to host on property. It's actually the second year that we hosted in them. So I just wanted to throw that out there. I know my kids have been begging me to put up the Christmas tree, and I try to at least wait to let Thanksgiving get done and over. So uh, so super excited about this and uh, getting into the holiday season. And Jose, I'll just point out, uh, if you go like that bottom right photo, you see the two neon lions. Uh, those are those are now relocated to Forest Park, but they'll be part of a new MGM installation on the Bright Nights tour through Forest Park, where you know tens of thousands of people annually come through as part of the bus tour. So it's a great leaping lion installation that we uh, are going to present. It'll be it'll be one of the, in my humble opinion, one of the cooler installations out at the park. But great great branding and and talking to a, a great audience. Thank you. That's all I have. Thanks, Jose. And then just to close it out, go ahead, if you click it for me, click it for me, Jose. Uh, just on development update, um, 
31 Elm, which uh, obviously has uh, taken some time to, you know, to progress along. Uh, I was with the, the folks from Mass Housing in the last couple of weeks. We've been distributing a, a, a master agreement between a bunch of parties who are involved in this um, agreement. And uh, I think there's a, a call scheduled for the next week or two to confirm that we're all done and start coordinating um, signing the document. So hoping I'm not jinxing it because it's been a, a work in progress. But we feel very good about um, progress along those lines. I know uh, that the city has done some work to keep the building um, spent some money in the building, given the, the winners coming, to make sure that we're ready to to move forward with um, with the uh, construction. So, short of a formal announcement, but we're getting very very close. So um, that's the update. Wahlburgers, we're in the middle of permitting with the city. Again, we expect a summer of uh, 2020 opening of that facility. Uh, Armory, we're pretty happy right now, given the different developments going on to keep it as that flex space. Uh, we've got weddings booked in there. We've got the comedy series. Uh, it continues to be a great space um, to, to show off to the community. Um, solar panels are being erected up on the top floor of the garage. Uh, I think uh, we are gonna be ready to turn those on in, in the next 30 days. In fact, we're looking at a potential event around that. So th that project is well underway. Uh, if right now, if you went to our garage, you would see a ton of activity in the valet area uh, because we are expanding free valet and, and, and um, expanding paid valet and free valet for certain of our customers up to our second floor. So it involves putting in some infrastructure with swing arm gates, et cetera. So a lot of activity in the garage. And then sports wagering, I can say we've had some, uh, continue to have good meetings with the legislature. Uh, I know your staff has been in some of those conversations. And we feel, uh, we feel like it, hopefully it's a matter of when and not if um, legislation is passed to allow us to move forward with sports betting. There's a consensus with the, with the leagues and with um, some of the fantasy, fantasy sport operators as well. So some of this has been consensus building, but I was in a meeting where we're all represented and we're able to say that we've got alignment on 90, 95% of uh, what we believe are the issues. So uh, we're, we're continuing to push forward, but we think there's uh, good progress and momentum there as well. And with that, that concludes our Q3 report. But thank you for all your support. And um, it's been a wonderful year. And we're looking forward to delivering yet another wonderful year. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Joe. And, and thank you, MGM. And good so, job, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you. And, <laughs> and yes. Um, and Rebecca. safe travels back. Um, I think at this time it might, uh, would everyone like a five minute break? And what I'm anticipating for the agenda now would be, we'll take a five minute break for my fellow commissioners and me, and then we will look at trying to get through items five, six, and seven before we break for lunch at approximately 1 p.m. Um, well, I'm hoping that we could get through seven as well um, before lunch. Uh, it's legal. It's the regulations. And the, okay. We'll, we'll see if we have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mathis. Thank you so much. I, <clears throat> we'll see. Thank you. Okay, we're reconvening today's meeting, and we'll start now with item number five. Director Wells, please. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, the uh, item before you now is, came about because uh, we just got an inquiry from investigators. This is not something where we'd had a case or there was a particular a specific instance we were asking 
for, but um, given that we've done a lot of investigations now, one of the questions that came up was from investigators, well, what are we supposed to do if we get information about conduct uh, that uh, resulted in a criminal conviction that was sealed? Um, are we supposed to disregard the conduct or information about the conduct, whether it's from open source or uh, media articles or any kind of law enforcement connections, law enforcement databases? Uh, their question is, uh, are we supposed to disregard that and because the record had been sealed? Or is there a way to, uh, to use that? And there was uh, no particular position in the inquiry. So uh, given that I was asked that question, it seemed appropriate to get guidance from the commission on uh, the interpretation of Regulation 205 CMR 134.09 uh, subsection 1. Uh, I do want to point out this whole issue would not apply to exempt positions. So we have, uh, I think it's something like 2,700 uh, employees right now. So those uh, positions, if they turn over, if there's additional registration requirements or licensing requirements, oh, pardon me, it would only be registration requirements, that would not be an issue for those employees because if they're exempt, they don't go through our uh, background process. But for the uh, positions that are non-exempt registrants and for licensees, these are the GEL, uh, key standard or key executive level, the question was, uh, what is the commission's policy directive to investigators with respect to information about conduct? So we have presented, uh, you know, some hypotheticals. We don't necessarily need specific answers as to the hypotheticals. We just put them out there because it helps with the thought process uh, and make sure that the investigators are following the direction of the commission. The, um, you know, one thing we are um, suggesting is that we just sort of lay the, the issue out for the commissioners at this meeting, just so you're aware of the issue. We've been in contact um, with not only the legal department, but also Jill Griffin, because she has contacts in the community. The issue of getting people to work who may have um, some criminal history was a, uh, a big issue uh, earlier in the commission's history, and a lot of those community groups had a lot of interest in uh, what the commission's position was on that. Uh, so uh, one of our recommendations is that uh, we give it some time after this meeting for, um, for Jill to contact uh, those groups to let them know what the issue is and see if there's any feedback. There may be um, information that I'm not aware of or the Commission may not be aware of that we may want to consider. So for right now, I just wanted to alert the Commission that we had this question. Just want to uh, make sure that investigators are following the uh, directive and um, just to clarify what the intent was behind the regulation. So that's where we are right now. Before we um, start comments, uh, uh, Loretta, are you going to be addressing this in any more detail? Uh, I, uh, I had not uh, okay. planned to offer anything, but certainly I'm here uh, if questions uh, come up uh, from any commissioners, and I would try to be helpful. Okay. Um, uh, Cam well, Commissioner is, Cameron? Please. Is this the... Uh, are you asking that we talk about each of these scenarios now? Are you asking for our thoughts on um, risk and the analysis of risk? Or I'm just not sure um, the timing of this, if, if that's. We did intentionally did not put it on for a vote today. So right. it's not as if we need an answer to these hypotheticals. We, an we, we put the hypotheticals in the memo because it, it Without understanding the scenarios, it's hard to, to speak about it in the abstract. Mm -hmm. So um, I think generally um, what the IEB is looking for more than anything is clear direction that we can apply during investigations both fairly and consistently because we want to make sure that similarly situated individuals are treated the same during the process. Um, you know, ultimately, it could be an answer of we, as the commission, our, our intent is that anything that's sealed should be out, similar to a motion to suppress, even the conduct itself, don't consider it, 
Or you could say, hypothetically, that on the other extreme, that while the records are out, if there's information, other information about the conduct that may potentially be used, although I will point out, without the record of the conviction, if it was what would have been an automatic disqualifier, because the record was sealed, it would no longer be an automatic disqualifier because we're not entering that information into the evidence at a, at a hearing. Mm -hmm. So it would be discretionary whether it would potentially tip the scales in a, in a but it's in that discretion, wouldn't that be considering that information? Correct. So that's what I want to make sure. Well, the, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky distinction. You would not enter information about the conviction. So hypothetically, someone stole something. You wouldn't enter into the, fact, enter into the record at a, at a hearing the criminal conviction for stealing but you might have information through an open source or the individual might have made a statement or there could be an information that there's an admission, yes, I stole and I stole from my prior employer and this is what happened and then I got fired, which you, so it, it's a tricky distinction. I just want to make sure that the investigators are following what the commission's directive is mm -hmm. because you have the discretion to tell us how you want us to handle that. To just and just to extend that, <clears throat> the in, if the employee said during an interview, I I stole something, I was then terminated, mm -hmm. but then doesn't go on to say, and I was actually convicted of theft. Mm -hmm. Then you're saying that there would possibly be an option to consider that um, that, but it would not be a dis could no longer be a disqualifier. Correct. So we want to know. Do you want us to consider that, or do you want us to put that information to the, to the side to, and, and then use whatever other information we had to make a licensing or a registration determination? And, and just, I, and just one, one, yeah. one other really, just a clarifier on sealing records. Mm -hmm. If you could just explain the process about right. sealed records. I know many people believe it's in the context of juvenile records only. Could you explain sealed records generally? Generally, uh, there are uh, statutory provisions that allow individuals who have been charged uh, and or convicted of criminal offenses uh, to uh, have their records sealed. Uh, convictions uh, may be sealed in an administrative process that does not go uh, to a court. And there are uh, time uh, uh, constraints uh, and measures set out within the administrative sealing statute. So for instance, uh, misdemeanors uh, that occur occurred in a three-year uh, look-back window, felonies that occurred in a seven-year uh, look-back window without any open cases at the time of the sealing requests or intervening cases with certain uh, exceptions for certain crimes that the legislature uh, determined should not be subject to the sealing statute. Uh, if the individual satisfies those uh, time uh, eligibility requirements, the individual is entitled to this administrative sealing. There is another provision of the sealing statute uh, that relates to court ordered sealing and that allows individuals uh, in non-conviction cases who have had their cases, for instance, dismissed uh, or null prost or no build uh, with a uh, you know, grand jury voting uh, not to indict, uh, allows the individual to go to court uh, to have, try to have those uh, cases sealed. And in those instances, a court must make specific findings on the record that sealing is necessary to effectuate a compelling government uh, interest. Uh, we, this commission is not involved in uh, actual sealing uh, efforts. That falls to other uh, state agencies. Uh, sealed records are not destroyed. They do remain available to law enforcement agencies. Uh, and also, for instance, courts uh, can uh, and do look at sealed records in sentencing uh, instances um, in, for subsequent cases. Uh, so that is a very general overview of uh, the sealing statutes. Just um, 
and that's helpful. It's helpful for, for me to understand. Um, can you just give a rundown or any kind of list you would think of as to why a person would make an application to have their records sealed? Well, I think uh, one of the, if not the main purpose behind promulgating the sealing statute was the uh, notion of second, second chances. So I do think that individuals go through that process uh, for employment uh, purposes, for employers. Uh, also, the sealing statutes themselves address licensing agencies and uh, direct that licensing agencies like ours uh, may not consider the sealed records themselves and that individuals who have sealed records can answer no on applications uh, for licensing purposes uh, as to whether they have a criminal history, they, they may lawfully answer no if their record is sealed. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, housing may be another uh, type of situation where an individual might, see, uh, might seek to have a record uh, sealed. So you're talking about in the context of a second chance, if I was an individual, I went and got a record sealed, if I continued to be a bad actor or continued to have some incidents pop up, it's not like, do you get second, third, fourth chances to kind of keep going back and resealing additional information or is at some point those administrative bodies say, yeah, that's uh, enough. I think you can keep going back and on that administrative sealing, it, you know, they look at the, they take off the years and they have to look at whether they were intervening uh, intervening crimes and okay. you, you can keep going back and they do it almost like a mathematical equation is my understanding. You know, I, um, if, I, if I may just start a little bit, um, I'd like to hone in on the regulation on two key words that I see here and that is the considered um, and the shall not. Uh, everything else is really good background for the purposes, etc. And, um, and the scenarios are pretty helpful that you put in, but I think they speak to other things. They speak to means of investigation and requirements of disclosure. If we wanted, if we had wanted to write something to the effect in which applicants shall not be required to disclose, and then you come up with that information some other way, then I would believe that there's, there's room for that, you know, to consider that, um, that information because you didn't, they weren't required, but you are able to consider it. Um, there's also, um, I would argue, in this regulation, I think there's an assumption that you actually may come into these records. Um, you may, oh, well. but you shall not consider them. Well, we're, we're trying to differentiate between the court records, so the records of criminal appearances and criminal dispositions, with, but for lack of a better understanding, the documents at the courthouse mm -hmm. versus other information about what happened that led to yeah. that incident. For example, because of our world, it would be if something came up on social media. Correct. If it was documented in a newspaper article. Are, it's all these open source information that <clears throat> will address a conviction that really is not sealed off. The documents at the court are sealed. That information is out there. We all know there's a lot of information mm -hmm. out there. And what could happen, as I understand it, is that inadvertently or purposefully in a, in a license review, information could come out about a sealed case that we didn't anticipate. And what you're looking for is guidance as to, because I think as I understand it, the word information seems to be connected to the delinquency, Correct. but not necessarily with respect to the records of criminal appearances or criminal depositions. Right. I, is that right? Right, right. So okay. we're just looking for clarity on that. That just, that just feels to me, and I know this could be written in many different ways, right. uh, and I know there could be, uh, it, it, we could have put any at the very beginning of this. Um, 
and I know the qualifier, but, but, but as, I, as I read the regulation, the active verb here really is shall not be considered um, when making the suitability determinations. Um, I now, think it's the noun that we're struggling with, though. What? It's the noun. The records, is it records of criminal appearances, criminal dispositions, and information concerning acts of delinquency. Mm -hmm. I think what, and, and maybe you, are, I don't want to be preaching to you, but I think that the issue is if there is, it doesn't say information in front oh. of records of delinquency. So if one of our um, <clears throat> researchers or uh, investigators find some information outside of the record, the sealed record, what do they do with that? Mm -hmm. Is that cool? Yeah, and, and you know, I don't think we need to, you know, be too particular onto the reg because right. you have the authority to change the That's reg right. and tell us what you want to do. So this is more just a uh, sort of a policy understanding. What do you want us to do under the circumstances that, that we have presented, where there might be information that's not part of the court record, that is not technically sealed as part of this sealing process, what do you want us to do with that information? We can disregard it. We can How do you know how do you know that it's tied to the record? Well what will happen so the investigators will know that a record's sealed. So we may so hypothetically, you may have something where there's a news article about an individual uh, was involved in a series of break ins in houses and that uh, individual may have been actually convicted of that and then but if the investigator looks at the media article, it may take a little digging to figure out, oh, wait a minute, this is tied to the record that's sealed. So then what does that investigator do with that information about the break-ins? Does the investigator if it's, if it's, disregard it because it's been sealed and that's the policy of the commission? Or is there, you know, if they make a statement about it, is right. that part of the analysis? So that's all we're asking. Yeah, and, and, and my, my, my position, if I'm not, not already making it clear, I think that, it, as it says here, it should not be considered. It's, it's not a may. It's a shall. There's a strength in the shall. If, if uh, I could, uh, just, uh, it, it doesn't say that. And it's, uh, it has to do with the records of the court, not the facts surrounding it. And this comes up not infrequently in investigations and prosecutions, where even in the motion to suppress example that Director Wells gave, the information that underlies a motion to suppress that it's allowed isn't gone forever and is not usable in any circumstance. Someone testifies and basically testifies in contradiction to those facts. I could, as prosecutor, cross-examine that individual with that suppressed statement. There are other vehicles in which that, that information and evidence and facts is, in fact, allowable and proper. So when I look at this, first of all, I disagree that, it, that, that it's written as you're interpreting it. But moving on to the fact that they're, we're moving toward guidance to them, there is another layer to the purpose of what they're doing in terms of background checks and in terms of patterns of conduct. So in the scenario of, yeah, I stole, I got terminated, you know, whatever, that may in fact help someone talk about what happened in terms of their employment history that gets them to suitability. So there are reasons that it may come in, and there are reasons that we may direct them, these are the narrow circumstances in which I want you to be able to use this or not, but there is a distinction as a matter of law and fact Sealing is court records. It is not expunging where it never happened. So we are in a circumstance where the facts are out there, whether you get it from news source, Facebook, the person themselves, it would then be in the possession of the investigators. Mm -hmm. And it is not simply because it's sealed, you, you shall not. It, it's, that is not what is happening here. So. Right. Oh. But with that said, for right now, you're looking for guidance because one, how to interpret what is written, right. and then the policy. Correct, because the, we didn't bring up this scenario when the regulation was developed because we hadn't been doing these investigations and nobody flagged the issue. So you have the discretion, you know, regardless of how you interpret this particular um, language, you may have a policy matter on how you'd like to do this, and we just would like that to be clarified for us so we're following the direction at, of the commission. Because to be fair to Commissioner Zuniga, obviously if we're not all seeing it the well, same right. way, yeah. then that points out that the regulation yeah, may, no, needs clarification, I, at least as to the, what we want the underlying policy to be. Right. Yeah. That's a good point. And I, I would love to speak to the, the policy 
and, and how I see this issue. Um, so, you know, obviously, the, the, to me, the, um, the, the type of license matters. If we're talking about a registrant, um, you know, without a lot of uh, ability to control um, and, 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 and much less risk, um, you know, I, I see this issue differently. And, and if there is just what I am always concerned about are the patterns, right? So if we have one sealed record, even though we find information about that sealed record, um, you know, I, I, I would certainly tend to say, okay, that's sealed, so we learned about it this other way, but the whole purpose is to give people employment opportunities. I, I, I don't see a risk. I see, okay, this person is going to, to move forward. Um, they did what they had to do, so I'm, I, you know, but when I see a pattern, which is very different, meaning they have one sealed record and we found out the, we found out the, the circumstances through another source, um, but then there are several other issues involved, maybe misdemeanors, um, you know, just a number of other, that's, their, their record is, is, um, is something that we really do feel like, wow, there's some risk here with this individual through this investigation. So that's where I see, um, you know, a pattern and, and, and using all of that information in the appropriate way. Commissioner, um, in, that, in that scenario, shouldn't all the other misdemeanors mm -hmm. establish a pattern by themselves? Without, well, without, you know, without this record, Could, couldn't we, I mean, the suitability standard is high. Um, and so if you have even a couple of uh, fill in the blank, you could establish the pattern in, in your scenario without even needing to consider the, the, well, the sealed I, record. I, I am or are you talking about only one more? to establish a pattern No, I don't, it's not that simple when you're an investigator. Okay. It, it is right. nuanced, it is, um, it is, this, I, I don't think it's a good idea, and I, you know, that you say, okay, you have one, you're good, if you have two, you're not. I agree. I, I don't agree with those, I, I think when you're looking at some, an individual, um, you need to look at the whole, which is what I believe they do, and I know that's not answering your question exactly, but I, what I don't like to do is take a tool away from someone when it does lead to something else. But I don't want the one thing to be used. Okay, so we found out a different way. It's, it's almost like, you know, you live in a you live in a um, big city, and so they're not going to publicize the burglary. But you're in a small town, and guess what? Everybody reads about the burglary. So I don't want that to be a case where we're treating people differently, based on um, based on one incidence. So, but I do think if, you know, you get something that's sealed, but you find out about it, it got a lot of, um, but then there's a whole history of other things, I believe they should be able to consider the totality of the situation in assessing risk. And I think that is possible without the sealed record, if you are at looking at other things. not the sealed things. record we're talking about. Well, yeah, I mean well, I, I understand yeah. that. No, it so just, it just. Um, I think that, that that's a really key point is that what I think is before us is this consideration of there is information that comes, and I, and I don't think it happens frequently. No, and that, I, I would like to emphasize yeah. that when we're talking about the universe of investigations that we're doing, and we've done for licensing of employees well over 8,000 of these. Right. So you, once you start narrowing the funnel, um, I would expect the situation where you're going to have this would be very, very few and far between, and the situation where it would potentially impact a decision on licensing, even fewer. So we're talking about probably a handful of cases. We just, you know, these are, these are people that, you know, are, are, that we're dealing with in their lives and their livelihoods, so we want to make sure that we're doing what the Commission's directive is so that we don't have to get up to an appeal before we understand what we should have been doing. So that's so, why no, we're I appreciate now. that. It, I think uh, just to emphasize again, to what we're looking for today is perhaps you would like some direction, not necessarily to resolve the underlying policy question, right. but some direction as to next steps. And, I, and I'm not cutting off the discussion, but I do want to emphasize that, it, that rather than the sealed record, 
uh, it is a dilemma that we have such an open market mm -hmm. on information now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's not in our headlines every day. And so the same thing, and I think uh, Commissioner Cameron's example is, is very real. The, the small town police log could have um, information about the arrest and not the conviction that would have been sealed. Right. So you'd have two. And so yeah. so yeah. we'd prefer it be consistent that um, people are treated the same. What, uh, so based, based on what I'm hearing, what my suggestion would be now is that um, it, this isn't a necessarily an easy answer. And we've been thinking about this for months as we prepared the memo and did research. So um, you know, given this is the first time you've had an opportunity to think about it, my suggestion is you know, look, at, look, at the, look at the hypos you know, individually, come and talk to either Todd, Loretta, um, you know, Jill, or myself. And we should also listen to the comments from the public and see what their, what their input is on that. Uh, and in the meantime, staff can see if we can come up with any other, or, or uh, other options besides the two extremes, if there's any intermediate options. And then we can circle back at either probably the next meeting and then sort of narrow in on the issue and see if there's, if we can get some more clarity, if that seems like a good plan. So is the distinction seem to be here the difference between information and records? And if I can jump in, it might be helpful to think about it as the agency that seals the records only has the authority to seal the court records. The agency can't tell the media there's an article you know, addressing that, you take that off the internet. No, no. Or, so right. it's, it's it, the, you know, the, the, the reg uh, talks for adults, talks about may not consider the sealed records. Mm -hmm. So th the question is out there, what happens when there's information that we get outside of the record? And to just clarify one point, with respect to the conviction, even if we had information from the media, an applicant, a witness that there was a, quote, conviction, we would not consider the conviction um, because there really it is no way to fully establish that without the court record. So we're not talking about an automatic disqualifier for a conviction in any regard. But you would be considering it, which is what these regulations. Well, the, the, I would say we, to do. I would differentiate it between the fact that someone was convicted of a crime versus the actual underlying conduct. So the, and and they are they are different. Now they're obviously interrelated. So because of that, you may have a policy perspective on that. But that's the distinction, you know. So. Well. And to clarify, because I'm, I'm hearing uh, Commissioner Suniga's angst because you're interpreting it a certain way, that doesn't mean that with, in our next uh, few commission meetings, it might not end up being just clarified that we would keep out right. not only the um, sealed record conviction, but also the information because it may just seem almost unrealistic if you're thinking about the arrest for shoplifting, how, and that has been sealed because it was a conviction, how can you actually consider the article that said they were arrested and, and feel right. that we haven't achieved the underlying policy? But I'm also hearing there may be uh, an assessment of risk that we might want to engage in, um, perhaps as the, the licensing goes higher yes. up the, mm -hmm. and so that might be there might be room, because we're looking at this, to maybe clarify. But the reality is, is right now we're not saying we don't agree on, a, on any particular policy position. I think we're saying we'd like to explore this further. That's what you're looking for Yeah, which I, which I think is, is reasonable. I mean, we've been thinking for a, for, for a long time, and it's, it's a tricky issue, and, um, but we need a clear answer. And, 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 and in terms of today's discussion, again, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. One thing that we wouldn't have if we really fleshed out all of our positions, I just want to be clear, we have not started to collect in any of the public right. um, input. And that's another piece I'd love clarification on how you plan to do that. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. We should understand how this affects people. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. By the way, I should, I should mention that I fully recognize uh, the scenario in which uh, this consideration could be positive for, for the applicant. If you, exactly. if, you, if, you, if you come into ways, into additional information, um, maybe from the applicant themselves. Um, and that, that's, something, that's actually a good point because um, these suitability investigations are a predictive analysis. And sometimes when you know, we see, even if someone's got some baggage or something that they, they have in their past, the investigators, when people are forthright and honest and mm -hmm. talk to um, investigators uh, truthfully, that's a win for their, in their column. So it's not necessarily because we found this out, oh, that's necessarily bad for you. It can actually be good to, Mr. Zine, mm -hmm. to uh, Commissioner Zuniga's point. I, I think, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I think that's an important point. You know, we. we going back to uh, the early days, even before opening of these casinos, right? We were constantly trying to address the issue of how can people who have maybe not found themselves suitable to get into some of these positions take proactive steps to position themselves better for a job. We obviously made the changes in the law for the SER exemptions. Uh, I know a number of the groups that have probably been in touch with Jill have been communicating how someone can go about and get their, their record sealed. Um, so I know probably Jill can take some of this information, share this you now public memo to get feedback from those appropriate groups. Um, but I continue to think in the bigger context of how do we again kind of uh, communicate this out in terms of, you know, I, th I think to the point, Commissioner Zuniga and Karen, you were just making, you have a seal record, but your, your honesty and kind of forthrightness with an investigator to share that information, you know, helps in the suitability process or helps in the licensing process. So, um, you know, getting a policy answer on this, I think, is helpful. Um, and I appreciate the, the comments of my colleagues who have been in the law enforcement field. Um, but kind of thinking through all of the ancillary issues that might come with that. Right. IEB's approach, uh, helpful suggestions, again, as we always try to refine them through FAQs or something for the actual applicant. Um, so I think, I think it's, it's bigger than just making this issue, you know, solving this question for your investigators, but let's look at it it's in kind of its entirety and figure out how we can come up with a solution. I do think it would be helpful also moving forward to have a little more of an explanation for everyone on the commission that there is a distinction between substance and process expungement versus sealing. Mm -hmm. This deals with sealing and I do think it would inform everybody's views and information on this to understand that there's a distinction, there's a different process and standard that needs to be reached to expunge um, versus sealing and I do think that that would help clarify the discussion. There is, there is a good note in, on page three, which is helpful. That the consequences, you want, but you not want. the actual process yeah. that are right. distinct. Right. Okay. Well, I, I would like to hear from, you know, the workforce development world. Yeah. I know we had a, in the state, a big recent Cori reform, and yeah. some of the discussions were all around one of, you know, some of the, um, uh, the reasons for, for that reform were about also a uh, second chances for right. people. Uh, I think that ultimately factors in here. I know that the licensing of, a, of, a, of an employee at a casino perhaps is a bigger threshold uh, in, in, you know, compared to other employment. Mm -hmm. um, and I also would like to, us to think about maybe this is something that we could tear uh, because it affects, it, it could potentially affect, you know, different people in different ways. Um, you know, uh, being a porter at a casino might be very different from, um, because you touch the casino floor, you still require uh, a registration. Right. Um, maybe very different from somebody who's extending credit, mm -hmm. let's say, and, and information about them goes directly to that. Uh, there's, there's other pieces of, the, of, of our regs that I think gonna bring in a little bit here. Um, and, 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 you know, that is those tiered uh, uh, assumptions. Um, but also how some of this information is to be viewed. Um, I remember one that was recent, the, 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 the subject of a recent appeal, um, and that is relative to how um, 
matters should be viewed in the most favorable mm -hmm. uh, way to the applicant. Um, you know, and, and I think uh, uh, that also factors in. So I, I, I'm, I'm okay with, you okay. know, hearing more uh, and maybe, you know, thinking of ways in which maybe we need to clarify yeah. uh, this regulation if that's what's required or continue okay. that policy for now. So yeah, I, I, would want, I would add on to that. I don't want us to wait too long. I mean, I think we've been lucky yeah. that we haven't had it right. just pop up, but right. let's not run the risk of that happening. Right. Uh, and, you know, also encourage, uh, you know, the groups that, uh, you know, Jill will be reaching out to, to again, remind somebody who thinks their record may be sealed, and it is not, and that right. could trip that individual up as they get into the licensing right. and registration process. Right. And, and the law is, if they do not have to put it on their application if it's sealed, we will be following the law. So right. mm -hmm. um, we can re reiterate that. So no, people aren't doing something wrong if they don't speak about it. That's mm -hmm. the law, is that they are not required to, to disclose it. And, and, and that's part of what I would like to kind of understand from what maybe those discussions mm -hmm. on corporate reform were. It just feels that, uh, you know, there's now so much more social media, you know, that the opportunity, maybe that's the wrong word, um, mm -hmm. the, the, um, the occasion for a lot of information to be just simply out there and never go away, right. uh, given the recent, you know, the, the world that we live in now. Um, should also be factored in. I think there's a real reality in, you know, which is what I, why, what I would go back to the considering it rather than the means of obtaining the information. Okay. But let's, let's see what we can hear okay. from. Okay, so we'll, from we'll move forward with that plan and then we'll put that on the next agenda, hopefully. And it sounds like what I'm hearing from, um, really from all of us is that probably, and as I think you're anticipating, once we get input from the public in, in light of some of the things we've touched on just on a you know, really low level, to give us perhaps options to help. Okay. Does that make sense? Um, to give us options for us to further clarify our discussion again right. without necessarily making a formal recommendation. But, the, but one of the options is definitely, if this is less than clear, we could amend the we regulation. Could clarify, right? Yep. right. Yep. Okay. Yep, however you want to do it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thanks for bringing it to our attention. Moving on to item number six, uh, Derek and Agnes and Doug, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I, we realize we're separating everyone um, between their lunches, so we'll try to get through this rather quickly. Um, it is somewhat um, non-controversial. We, we have all the time in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to it. I'm joined by Agnes and Doug, and we're here to provide you with the first quarterly budget update for fiscal year 2020, and then Agnes will um, give an update on our vendor diversity spend. Um, Massachusetts Gaming Commission approved a FY20 budget for the Gaming Control Fund of $34.2 million, composed of both regulatory costs and statutorily required costs. For the first time, the entire research and responsible gaming budget is funded from the Public Health Trust Fund, um, and licensees were assessed a combined $34.8 million for both the Gaming Control Fund and the Public Health Trust Fund, uh, that, that assessment to the tr uh, for the Public Health Trust Fund being for the first time. The initial FY20 budget contained two possible uh, spending exposures. First, the minimum required for the MGC's insurance policy was funded in the litigation budget, and that was about 400,000. Uh, second, the FY20 funding level included a 25% increase for public safety overtime to account for the opening of um, Encore Boston Harbor. However, uh, I want to note that it was half of the amount that was, was requested by um, the IEB. And in my opinion, um, when we funded it at half of that amount, it was a bit of an aspirational goal. Um, so I'm here to report to you that through the first three months of FY20, the overtime um, for the Gaming Enforcement Unit has spent approximately 47% of its total budget, 
and additionally the legal department has spent 72 percent of its litigation budget so both of those areas that were exposures continue to be an exposure um, the fy20 revenue for the gaming control fund relies on fees from licensing and slot machines and an assessment on licensees licensee fees appear to be on pace um, as is shown in attachment a to exceed initial projections for fy20 in addition, in late October, the MGC received approximately 449,000 in final payments related to the ongoing wind suitability investigation that was completed last fiscal year. Uh, an important distinction, the Commonwealth works on a modified cash basis of accounting. So while those fees were incurred last year, the revenue um, for when we bill them is actually recognized in this year. So we are up 449,000 in revenue from our initial projections based on that. Um, the MGC also had a surplus of 1.44 million in FY19 revenue, which will be used uh, based on our regulations to offset the licensee's FY20 assessments as shown on page two of the memorandum. In summary, staff will continue to monitor all spending and revenue activity with attention specifically to litigation and the GEU uh, overtime costs. Um, and then the balance forward of uh, 1.44 million in FY19 excess revenues result in a decrease to licensees assessments. Staff is not recommending any changes at this time um, to the budget due to the fact that it's only the first quarter and with the, the 449,000 coming through um, the timing of it for the wind suitability, it's in place to offset any, any um, additional costs that we may see prior to our mid-year update. That, if you have any questions yeah I, I would comments? really like to understand better those overtime costs uh, with the gaming enforcement unit so I think I'll be um, it sounds like you've had some a lot of direct conversations about that or we've had we've had some direct conversations with the gaming enforcement mm -hmm. um, unit about this um, mm -hmm. as you knew they asked for a five hundred thousand dollar increase to the budget um, for FY 15 FY 20 we gave 250,000. Um, mm -hmm. The overtime alone at um, Encore Boston Harbor has already exceeded that 250,000. Um, there is a piece of it that has to do with a uh, discussion of um, the nightclub. So there's some well, costs directly. Those are the things I want to understand yeah. because it could be that <laughs> we ask the nightclub to do things differently rather than correct just continually but um, that's that's not going to make up the difference I understand so, yeah. that I understand that's one component but yeah. I, I just want to understand better are there staffing levels uh, at the right level because uh, you know if you're constantly giving overtime you may not be staffing properly so which is a cost saver correct mm -hmm. because so, the amount you'd pay what we've charged out there right now in overtime could have paid for three well, uh, that's at least three what I need to understand and what the policy considerations are about around granting overtime. So uh, I'll be taking a closer look yeah, at that. And, yeah. and I was going to turn to Treasurer. In your yeah. Treasurer capacity and, and the sure. Executive Director, could we do some kind of a subset, further, deeper dive into this issue and get so I, a report I think, back? Um, Commissioner, um, the details mm -hmm. you know is it distinguishes from overtime yes at memoir uh, might be a big driver we probably need to look a little closer at that which sort of prohibit the uh, additional person because it's such a targeted um, need I guess and I think that's another subject it you is. raise the issue about <laughs> what is the responsibility of the licensee or the sub licensee Mm -hmm. yes. I think that's, a, that's an actual conversation we need to have. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I actually would like clarity on that point because I've heard varying reports as to whether the nightclub is assuming full responsibility or sharing it. And so. Or not. Or, or not sharing. I'm, I've heard varying reports. So. How would you well, that's, that's certainly something that we can we can look at. Uh, you know, we, we should. Uh, we, I, 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 I suggest we don't um, form a subcommittee. In no, 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 not a subcommittee. No, 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 <laughs> no, no. I'm wondering if no a sub <laughs> but, uh, meaning a sub but I, a but sub I report. Yes. yes. Uh, and get with that's a right. deeper yeah. dive on this issue. Absolutely. And have yeah. um, Derek come back. Yes. So, 
So we've done a pretty deep dive on this. Agnes keeps track of these um, regularly. I can I can tell you. I think through October it was about 345. No, through September it was about 345,000 in overtime spending out there, of which 72,000 was related to the details. That's state police only. We get billed separately for the um, for the city of Everett, Everett piece of it that goes into it. So, you know, you're looking at about 72,000, but what we are looking at is a similar situation that we face in Springfield, where you set into a staffing number that was approved at the beginning, and is that staffing number right? If you remember last year, we came back at the mid-year review and we added two troopers, as well as one um, Springfield police officer to help cut down on the overtime. We've seen overtime at, on, at um, MGM stay pretty consistent based on those increased staffing levels. Um, they've actually cut it down, you know, to where we where we hoped it would be. So there is that idea of do they need extra bodies and the staffing level just wasn't right. Because if you remember, we drove them hard on getting those staffing levels down at the beginning for these MOUs. Well, and a big part of that is data-driven. Correct. You, your deployments don't have to all be the same. You don't want the same number of people Tuesday daytime as you want Friday night. Correct. So. I just we want haven't to had understand that better, that. that how they're how they're doing that, and um, so I'll take a closer look. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it may, there, there's a factor. Just may perhaps to summarize uh, your prior point, there's a factor of just finding the right balance, or uh, you know maybe uh, another way to think about it is the growing pain of you know arriving at a, at a steady state like what we saw in MGM is now happening at at, at Anchor. Um, but I do also, the flip side of that is, I, I, I think, you know, we're gonna perhaps find that their operations are different by its nature, by its geography, or because Layout. there's a bigger, there's yeah. a bigger, yeah, by, by the sub, sub um, licensees that we yeah. have, you know, a, a, a memoir versus, you know, the Commonwealth Bar are not quite, a, you know, the same level of, um, um, of security and, well, and, and over time. And I, and I think we want to, I want to make sure that my position is clear is that I was asking for clarity around overtime mm -hmm. as opposed to our licensee's judgment on the number of the, um, their, their, the amount of the security that they're providing. In other words, I wouldn't want the message to be we're concerned about costs that we want them to do less. I want to understand Good how point. they're paying. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that Commissioner Cameron, I, I think that was really what you're wondering about the overtime, correct? Yes, yeah. but, but overtime leads to staffing, which Scheduling. leads to what drives the overtime, what occurrences, the data, what does the data show us? So it is, it's all of those things lead to the overtime. So we just have to understand the balance better. Correct, same conversation we had last year. Yes. We'll have the same deep dive going yes. to, do you need everyone there Tuesday at 4 yes. p.m.? Um, and can that be reported back to the commission as a whole is what I'm asking. Yep. Yes, we'll put that on the Thank calendar. You. Thank you. Can I only can I speak uh, quick, uh, briefly to the other point about um, the legal costs? I think uh, we are just doing what we've been doing in the past, keeping with the past practice. Uh, this was something we discussed with, like you staff discussed with licensees and they agreed on the approach. If, because there's so much um, variability or so it's so hard to predict the amount of legal fees uh, we budget one amount and you know uh, come back and correct us as, as a year goes by um, ask for budget revisions uh, as a year goes by so I think I think it's prudent there's you know some recent decisions about some of these litigations some of other uh, cases will we'll continue and we'll just continue in the same way that we've been doing uh, budgeting and revising as needed. Right. And I just want to say thank you to the team up here for uh, making it easy, as well as all the directors and staff who continue to have their monthly meetings with Agnes so that when we come up and do these reports, they can be as clear and concise as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent job. Good afternoon, Chair and Commissioners. In your packets today, you have the supplier diversity benchmarks for the Massachusetts Gaming Commission's total spending for FY19 
and for the first quarter of FY20. In FY19, we surpassed our benchmark for the small businesses and the minority-owned business um, totals. We did that substantially in both categories. We attained an 85% um, total of our women-owned benchmark, and once again, only 5% of the disabled veterans benchmark. Once again, we are working diligently on the disabled veterans with our office supplies um, to get that up this year, as well as our women-owned businesses. These, these categories remain a challenge for us. For the first quarter of FY20, we have already reached the goal for the small business benchmark. We've currently committed 54% of the women-owned business benchmark and 27% for the minority-owned businesses. We do have several upcoming contracts that will increase these commitments, and many of those contracts have vendor commitments for indirect spending that we will be counting on in our numbers as well. While these categories remain a challenge, we have ex engaged the services of a, a vendor, VeraCloud, who you'll be hearing from at the next commission meeting, to review our procurements and to reaching out to potential vendors for responses. Thank you. This is great work, uh, and I know VeraCloud that you mentioned has, has been um, really uh, helpful in this effort. Um, did we talk about at an agenda setting that whether we would come and showcase them in some way or to explain what they do in further detail? Yes, they were supposed to be at this meeting to kind of help, um, oh. because we never let, just like our licensees, we don't like missing benchmarks. Um, we take it very seriously. We don't like missing goals. Um, when we set our goals, while they may be aspirational, we still work hard to get there. So we wanted VeraCloud here to give the presentation on what we've engaged them to do. Some of the things we've done on our procurements as far as um, subcontracting, um, the vendor spend, the requirements by putting the um, percentage up in the scoring categories um, for, because look, we, we put our best efforts forward, we keep missing a, we keep missing benchmarks. So um, it's not okay to keep doing that. So we've engaged people who are better at this than we are um, to try and come in and help us meet these and figure out maybe there's just not a world of vendors out there. And if there aren't, how do we get them in? How do we engage them more? Um, and one of their big goals is inclusion, right? They want to make people, even though we may not win the bid, or that, that person may not win the bid. We want everyone to be included. We want to know the full marketplace when we're making our decisions. It's with the idea of have we reached out to everyone and do we have the best foot forward? And can we then sit with these vendors and help them? Um, what Agnes is talking about with the office supplies, that person's not, on even, not even on a statewide contract. We, we found them through the licensees bringing them forward. Um, and we have gradually um, hopefully help them to get established in the marketplace by giving them opportunities where we even spend a little extra on their supplies to build the pipeline. So if we bought from WB Mason, we'd be spending less on our vendor. I know our licensees probably don't want to hear that, but we'd be spending less on office supplies. But by going this, we're, hope, we're hoping to help grow the pipeline. And we're looking for that in other areas um, where it might, might not be obvious. And that's where VeraCloud teaming with our licensing division and teaming with our um, licensees have helped us. So we've got that to look forward to at the next meeting. And they, were, yeah, so they will be coming in. Yes. They had a conflict today, a personal conflict, so they couldn't make it. Good. Our agenda shifted just up at last minute. Yep. Thanks for that. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All set, Doug. All set, Doug. I guess so. Right. <laughs> Although we did, um, I will add something. We did change the uh, methodology of our payments over the course of the past few months, um, so it made things much easier for our accounting side. We were using a third party uh, to work with us on receivables, where they have been working on licensing payments, uh, and that was running fine. But then when we started working with the taxes. Uh, we ran into a little glitch, and it was uh, it turned into somewhat of an accounting nightmare. So we went back to wiring and working directly with the licensees, where they ain't paying on a uh, regular basis. They're paying within the statute. They're paying within 24 hours. So that has certainly helped, and it's running very smooth. Mm -hmm. We keep it light in financing. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Our licensees might not be as happy about that change um, because they have to pay the seven dollar per wire fee versus a forty cents per transaction for an ACH transaction. However, the vendor we had engaged with can't handle our business, um, so they came back to us and said, "If we are going to continue going down this path, you can't. You can no longer charge forty cents. It's going to be twenty seven dollars." Per so the, transaction. Per transaction. Yeah. So that was, that was quite so a jump. We went back, yeah, so we went back to the Fedwire process of $7, but we continued to work with our bank um, and with the state comptroller's office to try and find a solution where we can get back to ACH transactions. The problem with ACH, ACH transactions are I think there's a 10-day window where you can reverse it. So, so they were holding on to the payments for 10 days then it would have to clear their bank account, then get to our bank account, which takes another two business days. And by the end of the month, the comptroller was looking at us saying, where's all the money that we need to transfer? Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of, a, as Doug said, a pure accounting nightmare. Um, but with the sophistication of banking um, and the new processes that are coming out, I'm sure you use them on your own personal side, Zelle, uh, where you can do thousands of dollars o overnight uh, through ACH transactions. We're hopeful that within the next uh, 24 to 48 months, we'll be able to get rid of that $7 per transaction and get back down to closer to the 40 or 34 cent transaction of an ACH. But it is an added cost that our licensees have had to pick up. Um, but when we looked at the difference of 27 or 7, it was kind of an easy decision. Go back to Fedwire. Don't use a third party vendor that kind of gives you, hand, hand holds everyone through the process. Mm -hmm. But that was a long discussion that Doug has worked through, thank God. Once again, like I said, I don't have to get involved in these. I have a great team up here that does this for, for me, get, so I just have to make the decision 27 or 7. Mm -hmm. That's pretty that was an easy that decision. Like but we're, we're, st one. Yeah. we're still in the process of working with the bank to try to, to, try to formulate a, a lower price on that. So yeah. mm -hmm. okay. it's a work in progress. Okay. Yeah, it is. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. So it is now um, 110. I guess that I'd hope maybe we could get to the regulations, but we probably need to take our lunch break. And then we'll start in with legal and then move to uh, Commissioner Zuniga. OK? So for those who, yeah, that's the only thing. Um, I, I will need to speak with Janice. Thanks. OK? Thank you. So We'll come back at. So sorry, we'll reconvene in, uh, at, at 1.40. Okay. Thank you. We're reconvening meeting number 282 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. Thank you for those who have patiently waited. We um, will start now with our legal team on regulations number eight. Thank you, Madam Chair. And number Good seven, afternoon. Yes. Um, Ms. Teresi has been lead counsel on this particular matter. I'd like to turn the presentation over to her, if I may. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, you enough. have several regulations on the agenda today for a vote. Um, we're at the final stage of the promulgation process, so uh, following vote today, we'll go ahead and file these with the Secretary of State. We did not receive any comments on any of these, so this, uh, there is one comment that I'll address um, that came from the IEB, but otherwise these are exactly what you've seen before. 
Uh, so I just want to address item D first. That's section 138.05. We found that uh, we're not going to have you vote on this one today. We found that when we were getting ready for today that um, this one had been left off of the notice of hearing. So we just want to make sure that before we go on that this is properly noticed for a future hearing. So we'll push this off to the next meeting. Um, but it was purely an administrative change. It's not substantive. Which one was that? It's Kevin? item D, 138.05. Oh, okay. It's not in. It's not in the motion. motion. That explains it. <laughs> there you go. Um, so item A relates to junkets. Um, this one includes sections 134.01, which is the licensing regulation. This change requires self-employed junket representatives to be licensed as gaming vendors. Uh, and 134.06, which is our junket regulation that includes uh, licensing and other requirements for junkets. This is the only reg that includes one change from the last time you've seen it. So the IEB uh, recommended the, the one red line in there, which um, requires that license applications include proof that the junket operator has a business relationship with the gaming licensee. And this is standard for all vendor applications. Is it, is it necessary to have that language? I mean, it is a stipulation. If you're going to go through our registration and licensing process, you have to have that letter of business relationship. Th that's what this would refer to. Okay. So right. re require that so that we don't go through a background review if the licensee has no intention of having the arrangement with them, but that co essentially codifies in the regulation okay. that letter of intent. Okay. And, and the first one just clarifies that the junket representative is not employed by the gaming licensee? Is that just the definition? It just creates that other classification of license for the self-employed junket regulator uh, representatives, which was the group that wasn't already accounted for in the regulations. Because the, the employees of a junket enterprise are... They, uh, I don't have all, that uh, sheet uh, with me, but they're, they're already covered in that licensing yes. reg, and so are the enterprises, and so are the reps that would work for uh, a gaming licensee. So this was the only group yes. that wasn't included. Good, good catch. <clears throat> so if you don't have any um, other questions on those two, we'd be looking for um, motions on the amended small business impact statement and then the regulations uh, to move forward with the process. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the amended small business impact statement for 205 CMR 134.01, key gaming employee licensees, and 205 CMR 134.06, junket enterprises and junket representatives, as included in the Commissioner's packet. Second. Any discussion, questions, edits? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd further move that the Commission approve the version of 205 CMR 134.01, Key Gaming Employee Licensees, and 205 CMR 134.06, Junket Enterprises and Junket Representatives, as included in the Commissioner's packet, and authorize the staff to take all steps necessary to finalize the regulation promulgation process. Second. Any questions? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. All right, so item B is um, section 133.05, the voluntary self-exclusion list regulation. This uh, was a companion change to the junket regulations. This just uh, is really just to notify um, people involved in the VSE program that their information would be given out on this aggregated no marketing list by the licensees. And we're also updating the VSC application, so it will be on there as well. So they're acknowledging that they know that their information will be given out in that context. And this, um, this red line is what we've discussed in the past, right? This right. didn't come because of additional comments or consideration? No, it's the same. Any, any further questions for Carrie? Do I have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I move the Commission approve the amended small business impact statement for 205 CMR 133.05, maintenance and custody of the list, as included in the Commissioner's packet. Second. 
All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Todd, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I further move the Commission approve the version of 205 CMR 133.05. Maintenance and custody of the list is included in the Commissioner's packet and authorize staff to take all steps necessary to finalize the regulation promulgation process. Second. <coughs> Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. All right, and then finally, item C. Um, this is various sections of um, section 134, and these are all administrative changes. None of these have changed since the last time that you saw them. Um, there is one thing I just want to point out. The amended small business impact statement <coughs> does reference section 138.05, which we've pulled out of today, of the vote today. So um, your vote would be contingent on removing the reference to section 138.05 that's in that amended small business impact statement. That's the section, um, the item D on the agenda that I spoke about first. So the 205 CMI 138 is yes. in here? Oh, five. Okay, yes. Yes. So, we so we'll that. just strike just that. Zero, zero. Mm -hmm. That one? Right. Yeah. Go all the way to the back. Thank you. Over here. Small business oh, Right before the, the orange divider. The small business Yeah. No, 138.05 he's tricking out, right? Right. The reference in I small business impact just says 138. Yes. It yes. doesn't have the 05. Right. Any any reference to 138, 138 in that one will come out and we'll bring it back at a future meeting. Okay. So it will just be for uh, 134. 134 only, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Any any questions for Carrie? I have a motion. Uh, Madam Chair, I move the Commission approve the amended small business impact statement for 205 CMR 134, specifically sections 134.07, 134.09, 134.10, 134.11, 134.13, .11, and 134.14. Licensing and registration of employees, vendors, junket enterprises, and representatives and labor organizations is included in the Commissioner's packet. Second. Sorry. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Madam Chair, I further move the Commission approve the version of 205 CMI 134, specifically sections 134.07, 134.09, 134.10, 134.11, 134.13, 134.14, licensing and registration of employees, vendors, junket enterprises and representatives and labor organizations as included in the Commissioner's packet and authorized staff to take all steps necessary to finalize the regula regulation promulgation process. So Second. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5 zero. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent process. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item number eight. Uh, this is um, a report from Commissioner Zuniga on the game sense procurement. And there is a memo in our materials. Um, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I can get started, although I know Agnes Bolio was going to uh, join us. She was having her uh, lunch. Um, and Marlene Warner might be uh, able to come up and um, be, after my update, and Agnes, be available for uh, some remarks and questions. Um, as the memo um, shows and uh, or tries to summarize, um, we have um, undertaken the in the process of re-procuring um, our GameSense program manager, uh, who was in, who is in prior, has been the council since we started, and is uh, the apparent successful bidder that we um, will uh, be describing upon to my colleagues um, for uh, hopefully the ratification of, of their contract. Um, 
we started uh, this process, um, seems like four or five months ago? In July. In July, yeah. Um, uh, we uh, issued an RFR, as is described here, with, um, with the in notice of intent uh, to show with, with a lot of anticipation and uh, quite a bit of, uh, you know, good um, time frame for uh, responses. We, got, we received a number of, a number of questions um, as part of the, during the, the question and answer period that led us to believe that we might have more than one uh, respondent uh, to the RFR. Um, we try to make the RFR uh, flexible enough to allow for that and uh, including the option of um, maybe having these uh, game sense, um, these spaces be managed by, um, by different program managers. Um, in fact, one of the questions was relative to that. Somebody who was, it seemed from their questions, interested in, in perhaps managing the southeastern part. Um, however, we ended up receiving one, um, one response from, from the council. Um, we had in our procurement uh, team uh, we enlisted the help of uh, four people um, that have been providing us with a lot of um, help in the research review uh, efforts that we do. They also provided Mark with a lot of help um, in the procurement that is also ongoing of the research uh, effort. Uh, those people are um, Paul Smith, who um, is formerly of the British Columbia Lottery Corporation. So he has, this is where the, they implemented GameSense, uh, or the concept of, concept of GameSense um, to begin with. He's retired from BCLC and is now a gaming consultant. Um, we, um, we also had the help of Bruce Cohen, who is another retired former DPH uh, investigator who has been part of our Gaming Research Advisory Committee since inception, um, as well as Tom Land, um, who, like Bruce, has been uh, instrumental in our um, advisory research advisory committee, and Tony Roman, um, uh, who as, as well uh, has been part of these um, efforts. Um, myself, um, I was the the, the 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 fifth person in this in this committee. And um, we're helped by uh, Teresa uh, Fiore and Agnes Bolio in terms of um, the actual management of the procurement. Um, Commissioner, before yeah. we um, continue, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it, it, we all became aware that there was only one respondent and that it was the council. Yep. Um, <clears throat> It is my understanding, and legal, Todd, you can uh, weigh in here, that the five of us have made a disclosure. I know that four of us filed them uh, most recently uh, to uh, indicate that um, we could proceed fairly and objectively. Uh, we, have, we filed those with our appointing officials, and we complied with the Enhanced Ethics Code. Uh, <clears throat> we wanted the public to know and our appointing officials to understand that we thought we could proceed objectively and fairly, but we wanted to note that um, the former chair, um, my predecessor, uh, Stephen Crosby, is a member of the board of directors of the respondent council. I've added that I also learned that Paul Sternberg, the former executive director of the lottery for whom I worked, is also on that uh, board of directors. So we. Uh, disclose those facts. Those uh, documents are public documents and available through um, Elaine Driscoll, our communications director, but they're also on file with our appointing officials. Thank you for that. Uh, and I should uh, further clarify that I submitted that disclosure at the beginning of this process um, when it was first identified um, with my appointing authority. Um, and I should f further clarify that Mr. Crosby had no, and I, or anybody, had any kind of conversation on these matters, uh, neither the procurement nor the negotiations that I will later explain um, as, we, as, as we come forward today. <coughs> so 
in, in general, and maybe um, later our link could speak a little bit more to that, we wrote um, the RFP with uh, a real um, uh, sense of looking forward for the next few years and a real goal of improving the program. We know quite a bit about an evaluation that we did in the past. And so we wrote it uh, to include things like reaching out to disadvantaged communities, communities that may be, uh, that we know from research, may be in a position to be more impacted from gambling harm, uh, which is, again, a focus of this, of this program. It is for everybody. It's for different, uh, it has different uh, approaches, but it also uh, takes into consideration that, not, that non-white communities and other uh, groups are perhaps, at, not perhaps, are at times at, at a higher risk of experiencing gambling harm. Uh, there was another principle uh, that we embedded when we wrote you know, the, the, the RFP, um, and that was more presence and more outreach uh, out in the community, um, in, in, you know, in general terms. Um, the initial response back from the council identified a number of activities in, uh, in, in that regard in response to those uh, enhancements, if you will, or those additional um, aspects. Um, and they identified them as, um, many of them, as additional costs um, to the program. <clears throat> as part of the negotiations uh, that that ensued after, uh, after the review with the review committee, uh, we arrived at including as much as possible of those additional features, uh, community outreach, there is a cultural audit that I'll let you uh, speak a little bit more about, there's some data collection uh, that we'll, we, they, we will also be, they already, they are already in fact doing, uh, uh, as well as outreach uh, to those uh, communities, uh, non-white non groups and other communities of color uh, that are essentially within the current budget that we have um, um, for the program. Uh, that's, 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 in a, you know, that's in a nutshell, the, the, the subject of the negotiations. Uh, we come with what I believe to be an enhancement to the program for the price that we were paying uh, before. I should clarify that um, they are, we are allowing for the next two years uh, a cost of living adjustment that they, because this is mostly a program that has a large percentage of their, of their cost being staffing. Um, they are, because some of these um, employees are already in their first or second years, um, they are uh, contemplating some additional costs of, um, of living adjustments and the like that we're also contemplating for the second and the third year. So um, at this point, I can let Agnes expound if, if you think that I missed anything. Sorry, I think you got, got the timetable accurate and okay. the process. Thank you. Agnes, could you just clarify, I see in the memo that there's the balance for fiscal year 20. So that's 1.826 mm -hmm. plus some change million. And then, the, as I understand, it's flat funded from before or level funded from before. So what would the amount be annually? The, the grand total annually is 2.99 million. Two? Yeah. 2.999 million. <laughs> Almost 3 million the first, the first year. That's the first year. Yeah. And, and so the balance um, if, uh, all adds up to two point, and then it continues to be that on an annual basis plus the potential for the increase for cost of living. Yes. Correct. Yes. The program essentially costs around $3 million for, for us to run it. That's what we budgeted last time. Um, and that's annually? Yes. Mm -hmm. So the overall contract is, is a... a it, it's close to $9 million. A nine, nine about million. a $9 million with the option of renewal. And for three the years. additional three years, yes. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the same cost plus uh, cost of living adjustments. Correct. 
I should perhaps clarify for background. <clears throat> the, we arrived at this uh, uh, number um, progressively because we, we were asking the council to staff one casino after another as they were coming online. Uh, the, the prior numbers included, the, you know, the first years included only Plain Ridge Park. As MGM came in, we had a proportional um, uh, addition to, the, to that contract. And when Anchor came in, which is the largest operation, of course, um, that's, how, that's how and when we arrived to the three million uh, benchmark. Have we done any staffing analysis, meaning have you been able to determine um, uh, advisors and their staffing based on the need, meaning uh, busier times when, and other times, so I always use the term a Tuesday morning, where you may not need the same um, staffing requirements? Good afternoon. Uh, Good afternoon. Yes, we have we have been looking at that. I think it's something we're still trying to suss out a little bit more at Encore. Um, and again, our, our largest team is at Encore, but we have a, a pretty small team at at, uh, at PPC because we know that the need is just not as great there in terms mm -hmm. of, of the population. And, and we ramp up during the busier hours there. Um, at MGM, I think we are a pretty steady state at this point as well, and uh, do know the busier time, so we are able to flex that. I think we're still figuring things out at Encore. I should add that um, there was, um, among the review team, there were discussions prior to those negotiations to think about and consider, you know, whether a difference in schedule or a difference uh, in, in resources uh, would, would bring uh, cost savings. Um, as part of the negotiations, we are leaving the, uh, the ability to the council and the staff, in this case going forward, Mark, Teresa, but myself to some degree, determine where those, that timing might be better. For example, I we don't have any preconceived notion that every game sense uh, center should uh, should open at 10 a.m. Um, that's when they open right now, 10 a.m. Um, it's easy to get down the path of you know anecdotal um, instances in which you know maybe here we should be opening earlier or later um, or double uh, uh, increasing uh, doubling efforts, let's say in, in the evenings or the weekends. Um, all of that is, is to be analyzed for the efficiencies of the program, including the fact that we are now asking the council to think about how that community outreach and that presence in other places, not just at the casino, can be enhancing the program. Um, it may be that uh, as, as, as they are continuing uh, to manage the program, that they decide that they need certain flex time from certain people or it works better to do outreach in such and such dates, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Can I ask a question sure. about the terms of the contract? When it says three years with an option to new for up to three, is that done in one year increments or is it up to you it, know, the it, contract manager to say, we'll give you two, we'll give you three, we'll give you one? How's that going to work? It, it can be done either way, whichever you feel most comfortable with. We'll do the initial contract for the, for the three years um, with the budgets appropriately set aside, then at the end of the three years, you can step back and say, we only want to do it for one at a time, or you can do it all three at once. And back before the commission or back to the contract manager who's designated? That's something we could, we, you can designate. Way, we can you, write I didn't know if in. you had contemplated one way versus the other, have a recommendation one way versus the other. What I had contemplated is maximum flexibility for us, the ability to come back and say, you know, as in exchange, and I'm just putting out a scenario, in exchange of extending the assurances of a of three year renewal, we get some cost savings, for example, or no, we're only going to do a, a, the fourth year, one, a one year extension and see how it goes. Uh, again, just to give ourselves the flexibility. Uh, if, if you want, we could come back for those those instances, you know, just given the size of the of the uh, of the program uh, of it, the contract, it, it is I, a clause that we can put in the contract however you wish. That yeah. we can, at at the end of 
um, you know, six months prior to the end of the contract, we can look at it again to see whether or not we renew for one, two, or three years at that time, and it can come before the commission and require a vote. If that's what you want, we can do it any way you see fit. I actually think that makes sense. Three years, the appropriate amount of time to reevaluate, meaning mm -hmm. give us an update on how it's working, you know, what the status is, and then I think the commission can decide or whoever will be members of the commission three years from now, mm -hmm. um, you know, can really take a look and, and decide um, what the appropriate extension, if there should be an extension A, B, if uh, what the appropriate length of time is. And if you need time for some corrective action or to mm -hmm. improve the overall performance to give them a trial basis to correct those things within a year? Yeah. Makes sense. I, I would recommend that you look at it like six months before yes. it's mm -hmm. due, just yeah. because that way if there should be a decision for reprocurement, you've got the you six months time. in which to reprocure if you need to. That makes sense. You note that in your calendar. Hmm? Put that in your calendar. I will not be here. I'm sorry, but she will not be here. <laughs> She's not the only one who will um, be here. The master her. calendar. She's I, I'm assuming we also need to uh, take action steps to designate a commissioner. I think the gentleman to my right would be perfect. And Agnes, for the time that you're still with us, can we designate you as the contract manager for the time being? That's fine. I can do that. I just wanted to clarify a couple of things. In terms of as, as I've thought about this contract, um, I understand under the Enabling Act, which is eight years old tomorrow, um, that our licensees must allow for a complementary um, on-site counseling services, and those are both substance abuse and, and mental health um, services. I know that that's been fleshed out in earlier commission meetings. Mm -hmm. But they, they must be on site, they are to be services, mm -hmm. and they must be administered by an independent entity. And that's where the council's expertise comes in as the service provider. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> it, did the procurement team um, to see the number of FTEs or how much of this is salary versus administrative costs. Did you have a sense of that in terms of the overall cost breakdown? Yeah, I know that it's, on, it's probably online if I went and looked at it. I, I saw that link um, late, so my apologies. Mm -hmm. Well, let, 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 me, um, let me try to answer the, uh, the, the, that question you know, the, the following way. There was a lot of discussion uh, relative to data measurement, uh, eventual evaluation, and I'll come back to this in a few minutes, and, um, and number of, and, and quality of interactions. The, a big metric for the program is um, just how much and how many times um, the games and advisors are uh, interacting with with patrons, uh, patrons who at, at different levels, patrons who are occasional um, um, uh, players and more intensive players, all the way to and including either referring somebody for additional help or uh, signing them up in the voluntary self-exclusion program, which is a big part of what actually happens with, with this program. So uh, the reality is that uh, um, it's, it's, there's, there's some challenges in how to measure and how to drive additional um, interactions. Um, let me make a small parenthesis here, um, which is the reporting and the data collection. The council has done, since the last evaluation uh, that we did on the program, uh, the council has done a lot of data collection uh, relative to those interactions. And they have submitted uh, reports now to that effect as part of their contract with us. We have not brought them to this commission uh, because we were going undergoing the procurement uh, process. But there is a new format of reporting that you will see soon 
um, and you will soon see periodically, um, that speaks a lot to how they're driving uh, interactions and how they're measuring uh, you know, the different interactions and how they're driving quality of those interactions. Um, this is a program that we intend to um, evaluate um, soon. Um, you know, now that they're, in the next couple of years at least, um, one, now that they are, uh, are gonna be operating with some years in, in, in the experience side, uh, in all three casinos. Um, let me come back to the initial point I made, or the parenthesis about data collection. As part of the uh, initial uh, evaluation, the people that we asked to, that, to do that evaluation came in and put a lot of um, onus on data collection for that evaluation on the council. And um, that, that was just the approach. Um, the, the council is now doing a lot of data collection uh, that, that includes what, what, we, what, they, what that evaluator thought was gonna be important. But we agreed that any future evaluation is going to be done, and including the data, the data collection, will be done by that evaluator, not the council. Mm -hmm. So they can concentrate on the data collection for management of the program. Mm -hmm. And that gives them a little certainty that, you know, that is not going to add to the burden of what they already do. So I guess my question was, in terms of their budget, yep. how much of the budget was allocated, what percentage was allocated to FTEs and, and part-time employees, employees, human resources versus administrative costs? Were they, were you able to see that breakdown? Yeah, you might, you might have a, um, I, I don't want to, you may have a better number than um, uh, off the top of my head. It's, it's a 70 plus percent uh, labor cost. Uh, do you want to, do you get that somewhat okay or? Well, it's funny because I just said to Agnes earlier, they're not going to ask me any questions about numbers, right? Uh -huh. um, I mean, the indirect cost, which, so I don't know, um, Chairwoman, if you're asking specific to administrative staffing or if you're asking to an indirect rate. Well, the indirect rate is always interesting. I was just thinking when you pre presented your budget to the procurement team, really, how does, how do we get to three million? Mm -hmm. Kind of in. So yes, I, I, it's, I think it's upwards of 75 to 80 percent are staff, um, and the remainder is other other things. And I wouldn't say that's just administrative. I would say that there's you know program supply costs, there's costs associated with trainings and um, conference things like that. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm. At well, that's actually helpful. So okay. those additional um, uh, costs are important. In, in, in terms of understanding the overall budget. So you're saying 70% really up, your human or, upwards or that, your, yeah. your workforce that go to the on-site and provide on-site services. Correct. And, and do we have a, uh, to, so that we can be completely transparent, did you do any um, comparison in terms of, um, I know British Columbia would be different, but we know that they run a game sense program. Do we have any um, any comparisons in terms of salary, or did we look at other social workers to know that they're being paid on uh, you know in the right vicinity? Do did we look at the salaries at all? Um, we we did not look at at, at uh, benchmarking salaries. Mm -hmm. um, that is something that the council must have arrived to, you know, to attract the people that they feel are, are qualified for, for the job. Do you um, know on the average what the uh, is? The on the average, I'm sorry? For a, let's salary. say, entry level um, advisor, game sense advisor. What a game sense say. advisor is typically making, is that what you're yeah, asking the average. me? average, do you have a sense yeah, of that? Uh, the game sense advisors, uh, when they come in, are making in the, low, like I think sixty, sixty-one thousand dollars 61000 Okay. I, I and then they get benefits on top of yes. that. And they get benefits, yes. Is there a, a minimum requirement you're expecting um, for those uh, advisors? Uh, so our, our, most of our advisors come from the gaming industry and um, we need to ha have time within the gaming industry. I don't know that we have a set amount. I'd have to go back and assess that, but I'd say most of them have 
uh, five plus years. Um, uh, what we look for when they come in to work for as a game sense advisor is that they've taken some leadership roles. So most of them have been a supervisor or a manager of some type. They have, um, a number of them have done training opportunities. Uh, and a number of the folks who work in the training industry and the um, gaming industry have other jobs. So we also uh, took that into account as well. But I, I wouldn't yeah, say language that. Language capacity. Uh, language capacity is another key piece. Yes, right. we have a number of, I think, you know, 11 or 12 um, uh, different languages beyond English, and that is certainly a, a strong consideration when we're hiring as well. So these are, um, we, we've we been well informed in terms of these are professionals who have gaming expertise. Yes. They often have social um, service uh, or mental health expertise and language expertise. I think, did I hear eight different languages, if I remember correctly? I, I think it's more than that at, at this point, point. yes. So, um, and then they make up about 70% of your budget. So you can Correct. see, so that, that's how, about a workforce of how many, Marlene, in terms of numbers? So for our Game Sense Advisors, we have, uh, it's, I think there's 27 of them in total. So I know early on you were not looking for gaming experience, correct? And correct. And that, uh, that was a lesson learned from this program? Absolutely, so when we first mm -hmm. uh, reached out to uh, BCLC, British Columbia Lottery Corporation. Uh, Walt was uh, one of the people that helped us at BCLC and he swore up and down and sideways that we should only take people from the gaming industry to which I was sure he was totally wrong. And um, what we've come to find out is uh, individuals who've worked in the gaming industry are incredibly well trained. Uh, I liken them to, although I've never worked in, um, in, in uh, you know, in a police setting, but I certainly think that they have eyes in the back of their head. They always are assessing what's going on on the floor. They know what um, uh, what patrons are, um, their affect has changed. Um, they're really able to always be checking. Uh, they also know the games inside out and backwards as well and uh, can explain, they can explain the rules of the most difficult, most complicated games. They really can simplify them. So having all that, um, has been an immense value. I can't really kind of explain how important it has been to have those folks. I will also say is they're comfortable in a casino. And so when we had brought folks who had come from a social service background or um, um, who had a you know more clinical background, it's a hard adjustment, right? To go from a clinical setting into working in a casino, that is not a comfortable transition for a lot of folks. It takes people a while and, and oftentimes people are not interested in doing that long term. So um, we have found that the strength comes from people who have um, had that leader, those leadership roles, who've had that gaming experience, but who have honestly have felt um, held back from helping patrons and customers in their previous positions and want to do something more, have struggled with being on that side of the table or um, being in the um, you know, slot banks and not being able to help patrons more, not feeling empowered to do so. They come to GameSense and feel like they have a new lease on the gaming industry. And I would add, uh, only add to that that, uh, you know, there's, it's really these uh, customer service type of hospitality uh, training that comes with the gaming industry that is really also very valuable for the program. Uh, they engage with customers well. Uh, they're friendly. It's all about attracting and, and, and eliciting uh, conversations. And that's also a very, a very much an asset of the program. Um, let, let me mention something else um, that I just thought of uh, on a prior question, uh, Madam Chair, and that is um, we should still and continue to think about the cost benefit of, of the program, and, and, and this is what we are, uh, you know, what we will continue to do. I liken it to, uh, you know, really establishing, figuring out the steady state when it comes to hours and workload. Uh, there, is, there is an assumption embedded here, which is that, you know, more game sense uh, advisors, slightly more game sense advisors are required for, for Encore because it's a much larger operation. It has double the visitation or perhaps more. It has double the employees um, than MGM, for example, and that is also a key area of interactions, just training employees and engaging with them. Um, but it may be that maybe the, the two to one ratio doesn't hold as we continue to, to think of, of, um, 
of hours and, and, and workload. Um, the 70% figure that, um, that, that we sort of put out there in terms of um, labor does include um, you know, manager level that do both manage um, advisors, do some interactions, engage with patrons, but also think about um, you know, ways to improve uh, uh, the program. And to me, there's this real balance, just programmatically, between s staffing it for so long that it becomes, for, for too long in the day, let's say, that it becomes really expensive, and staffing it their its skeleton crew that it becomes not noticeable to people uh, who are there regularly. You know, if people come in at different times and there, there's never an advisor, let's say, because they come at whatever times we don't, we're not, we don't want to be there or think it's not as cost effective, uh, the program begins and, and the visibility of the program begins to suffer. And that is, that is the balance that I think uh, will continue to try to strike. Um, the good news is that uh, just because of years, PPC gives us a bit of a comfort level that you know, we will arrive at what we will begin to see a steady state and, and they will arrive at what may be the right mix of uh, part-time versus full-time, who they also sort of manage with so that they can uh, respond to you know, more intense uh, periods in the day or the week uh, as opposed to you know, um, uh, and, and manage the program uh, effectively. Do you want to expound on that, uh, Marley? I think one of the other things we're starting to learn, we were, is so we have once a month where we uh, attend a games and strategy meeting where it's uh, MGC staff, it's um, Mass Council staff, and then it's the, the licensee staff who interface with GameSense in some way, typically compliance, um, some internal marketing and sometimes external marketing folks, security, sometimes surveillance is there. So just yesterday we had a meeting at MGM and similar to some of the events you heard about today, we heard about kind of all the events, but we really go over those events to say, you know, um, for the winter weekend, uh, you know, with the Red Sox, which by the way, I have to get my tickets before they're all sold out, but the <laughs> winter weekend, um, what does that actually mean for game sense, right? So that means that there's people who are probably thinking about um, gaming and gambling when they're around for the winter weekend. That means there's kids in and around the casino and the casino area. How can game sense be useful with that? That means that there are opportunities for game sense to be milling about and talking about how you keep this fun and entertaining, whether they're inside the casino or outside the casino. So those are the type of things that we're gonna put extra staff on that Friday and Saturday in, in January um, and um, need to kind of be thinking about. Those are the things we can't always anticipate, we don't always know. Um, both Encore and uh, MGM talked about events specific to the Asian population and bringing in specific um, concerts and an entertainment uh, acts. Those are opportunities where we would have our um, uh, staff who speak various Asian languages coming in and making sure they're interfacing with the guests. We're bringing in specific brochures. We're thinking about a specific game um, to engage those customers. So we're really trying to um, have a ready state while also responding to some of these events and we're not always obviously aware of we're not unfortunately we're not in the conversations with MGM and the Red Sox have invited us yet but um, those are the type of things that we would love to know and continue to respond to I think game sense is as effective as um, the inclusion we're allowed uh, on site and I think we have to continue to figure that out listen the licensees have been amazing and I'll tell you, having been here from the beginning, um, they were pretty resistant and concerned about who these, you know, non-paying residents were going to be on site at their casino. You know, I'm hoping on December 19th, uh, when Mark gets to present some of his programs and you see the licensees come back, you'll hear from them how they feel just the opposite at this point, that this is a real value to their casino operations. So, um, so we are still figuring this out, even though, and I can't believe it, that it's been eight years since the announcement came down that we were gonna have casinos in Massachusetts, that we are in a, in a different spot um, than we were, and I think we'll 
in three years, hopefully when we're here talking to you about why we should continue to be the GameSense operator, we will have learned a lot. And, and are you, do you feel like you are tracking appropriately, which is so important for evaluation, meaning all of your interactions are tracked, the numbers that move on to further recommendations, whether it be counseling or self-exclusion, so, I mean, I think that's a really important piece that a lot of uh, new programs struggle to understand how important that is. Yes, I think that our Director of Responsible Gambling and our senior GSAs have done a fabulous job of really putting that into place and with the guidance of Dr. Dr. I just gave him an a, a increase, Director Vander Linden, could be a doctor someday, <laughs> and uh, Teresa. and. Um, making sure that we are asking the right questions and then they're not frivolous in terms of our data collection, but they actually mean something. So uh, we have a pretty extensive checklist that has been revised a number of times that the game sense advisors need to track every interaction. Um, can we get better at that? Absolutely. Are some people much more reliable in terms of entering? Because they're having a conversation and then they have to remember to not just immediately jump to the next conversation, but list it in and they're doing this via iPads most of the time. Um, I think some of the games and staff are so friendly with the, uh, the licensee staff that I think sometimes they forget that those are interactions they should be listing. Um, so I think there's certainly more we could be doing in terms of the integrity of that data, but I think that it's gotten dramatically better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the commissioner had mentioned earlier when there was a third party evaluator who came in and uh, how difficult that was and, and the practice was good because I think it really helped the game sense advisors at that point it was just at PPC to understand why we were asking these questions but the difficulty was that they were handing a survey versus having a conversation and noting it themselves they were handing a survey to someone and they had to kind of walk away so the person didn't feel pressured to answer the survey I mean the space is not very large right so it's it was awkward kind of socially awkward to do that so I think that was hard, but I think the actual data collection is good. I still think uh, right now on the VSC checklist, I mean on the VSC um, application, there's an um, opt-in to having one of our staff members call them back a week later. And we um, uh, do up to 10 tries mm -hmm. to try and reach that person at their request. I think there's more we could be noting about those conversations, about why we're not getting to that person. I think there's a lot more we still can learn. Um, I think the reinstatement sessions or the exit sessions when people are coming off of their term for um, VSC and coming back into presumably coming back to gamble because they're coming off this list, there's a lot more we can learn about that. I think one of the things that, that this program has had to figure out is this is it in the U.S., right? So we are the only program in the U.S. We are the only um, state doing uh, in-person exit reinstatement sessions. We are the only state doing a number of these things. And so we've been, while really well guided by BCLC, there's a lot of things that are very different about this program than even BCLC. So we've been kind of finding our way. Um, again, I think I'm very confident about where we are, but I still think there's, there's ways to improve and certainly data collection is one of them. The other thing that we've talked about is putting into place a positive play scale survey and that is going to be, I think, crucial. One of the things we have learned from our partners in Canada is that player segmentation is important. So right mm -hmm. now, one of the things we do is that, if my game sense advisors, which they do know all of you, but if you all were to walk in and play in clothes and they didn't know who you were, they would treat each of you exactly the same. Even though maybe Bruce wants to have a longer experience at the casino, you want to have a short experience, maybe you've gone with friends, like, it doesn't matter who you are, they're going to listen to you and they're gonna to talk to you, but they're going to have basically the same set of tools. We hope that with the data that comes out of this positive play scale that better assesses what, um, what is the knowledge people have, what is um, the pre-commitment to gambling safely, um, a number of measures, there's 14 um, questions in this tool we will be able to better segment the player interaction. So one of the things that they're starting to do up in, in British Columbia is say there's typically between five to six types of players, which is kind of remarkable given how many people walk in a casino all day, but typically five to six types of players, but the, they're able to better segment their responsible gambling um, interventions and tools to those various types of players. 
So we still have a lot more to learn here in Massachusetts so we can better gear what we're doing. That was a long answer to your short question. Yeah, thank, th no, thanks, <laughs> thanks for But it was I, a good one. That was, um, that was something I, I, I failed to mention at the beginning and I had written down that we should mention. And that is as part of the, the program that we are now uh, hoping to do in addition to what we were doing before is this player segmentation via the positive play uh, survey. I think that's really where the, where the opportunities sort of uh, come in, in terms of engaging in a different uh, but targeted way. And we'll continue to have uh, research and data collection feedback. Uh, um, as I mentioned, uh, I, I, I think we, uh, in the, in, you know, within the next couple of years, should be thinking about a program evaluation um, with the lessons learned from the first effort. Um, they're doing a lot of data collection that will help them, uh, by, by definition, um, improve their, their management of the program. Uh, I suspect you already noticed that who is really good at engaging uh, in terms of having conversations at what times, or maybe you know, who can be paired up to do a little bit of mentoring, or who is better at engaging with employees. And that is, that, that's all, those are all things that um, through the data collection and now managing um, three sites, um, we hope that the program will improve. I just want to add that um, <clears throat> while I've only been here really since February, my impression has been that there has been data, rich data collected. I've been able to learn so much about really the success of GameSense because of what you have been collecting and I, the idea that it will only get richer is of course better. I also know, um, again with my limited time frame, um, that Massachusetts is the envy of many other jurisdictions because one, the legislators had the foresight to include this probably very ominous requirement for any licensee here. And then my predecessor and fellow commissioners who were part of the decision to hire your council to implement GameSense uh, saw something special because GameSense is so highly regarded uh, really around the world. And you know, we can credit uh, Mark and, and Teresa in many ways for uh, really guiding that and Enrique and my predecessor Steve Crosby. Uh, <clears throat> with that said, all the accolades in the world, we do have a responsibility and I think that what I understand is that there were was vigilance over costs and that there were negotiations over costs. Um, we are getting something more than what we got before and so that seems to be all fiscally very sound. The services, I, I don't know if any of my fellow commissioners have any questions about that in terms of what has been going on. Any further questions? Um, but I can just say that uh, when you enter any of our licensees facilities, you have folks there who love what they do and they want to keep on doing it well. So thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah. I would concur. I. Uh, always enjoy stopping by and listening and learning and watching their enthusiasm and I, I know that it makes a difference with uh, those relationships that they end up having with, with patrons. So um, from that standpoint, um, I know that's anecdotal but it is, it is part of uh, observing what we do and understanding and I just think you've put together an amazing team. Thank you. Thank you. They are amazing. I'm very, very blessed to have them. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd move that the Commission award a three-year contract to manage the GameSense program with an option to renew for up to three years, as discussed here today, to the Massachusetts Council on Compulsive Gambling. Do we also want to designate? That's the second. We're doing Next a second. second. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Any further questions for Marlene or for Enrique, the Commissioner Zuniga? Would second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero. Thank you. Excellent work. And thank you, Agnes. Thank you. Thank I you. was glad to see you at the table.
Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, Thank now you. we do have that, the extra motion. On the, the, uh, the, Madam Chair, I'd, move, I'd further move to designate Agnes Bollier as the contract manager on behalf of the commission and that Commissioner Zuniga be authorized to execute the contract on behalf of the commission after consultation with the office of our general counsel. Second. <clears throat> and then the only um, additional clarification would be with respect to how we line up the renewal provision. Okay, so that's noted. Any further discussion? I think he referenced that in the, in first, the first motion. motion. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. We would come back. I was looking three at years. the other. Okay, so my, my apologies. All right, so we should be all set on that. Any further discussion or clarification for, <laughs> for me? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I was. Excellent. Now we can go to Commissioner Stebbins, please, on your recent form. Um, sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll keep it brief because I'm anxious to get to Cake and our friends from NCTE who are here. Um, but included in your packet, you have a, a just an update, uh, a memo from myself um, uh, regarding our Fostering Partnerships event here last week. Uh, just, again, a simple background. Um, kind of throughout this uh, eight-year period since the passage of the gaming bill, we've heard from a number of stakeholders who were excited about the inclusion of language focusing on minority women and veteran-owned businesses as part of the project. Uh, but the question was raised, okay, if I'm not a contractor, I'm not an architect, I don't offer supplies to one of our gaming licensees, what other opportunities are available? And uh, I think now with the opening of our uh, three licensees and their close work with our host communities, they are all beginning to think, what comes next? What are the additional development opportunities uh, as host communities begin to think about uh, what's the benefit of having this casino in our community? What are the development opportunities available? I know our community mitigation fund has actually funded some strategy making for uh, communities to figure out how they can leverage uh, the presence of the casino. So uh, again, taking in uh, all of the voices and comments we heard from stakeholders all across the state, you know, some prominent folks like Daryl Settles and others were big voices asking us to explore this a little bit further. Our gaming licensees were on board, our host communities were on board, so last week we uh, had a, a gathering in this room. We had about 50 uh, guests who represented MBEs, WBEs, VBEs, other state agencies, potential developers, uh, potential financing resources, uh, some of our partner organizations like the Center for Women and Enterprise and Initiative for a Competitive Inner City. Uh, they all got to hear firsthand from our licensees what their project has been. They got to hear from the host communities as, what, as to what the development opportunities are. And we hope we've started a conversation. So everybody who registered or everybody who attended got a list of all the other attendees. They got copies of all the presentations that were made. And, uh, and again, we hope this sparks a conversation as things move ahead and that uh, there's some good business opportunities and business partnerships that are formed. So uh, it was very, seemed to be well received and uh, you know, we hope these conversations continue. So, but that's the, the thrust of my report, which was in the packet. Mm -hmm. I'd actually like to um, thank Commissioner Stebbins for this initiative, having had the opportunity to attend um, the event. It was excellent. I met some interesting people and um, to listen to them and watch them interact and think about possibilities, as well as uh, President Mathis saying this morning that he's already received several emails about some of the opportunities that he talked about. Um, that's really encouraging. So I commend you for your initiative. Yeah, thank you. I credit Jill and Crystal and, and Janice and Jamie Ennis and Austin for all their help. and. Uh, organizing the meeting. I know that's not my strong suit, so I count on them. 
always helps to have a strong team. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really great to hear. I'm sorry I missed it, but uh, I heard uh, through John, who's not here, that uh, um, that it was a great success, that, uh, that there was a lot of great conversations, not just as part of the presentations, but uh, afterwards, and it appears that some will continue, so it's really great to hear. It truly became a networking event, but the presentations were very special to see the um, licensee teaming up with their host communities, and that was just made for a very special special presentation. It would be great to be duplicated, so thank you, Bruce. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, before we move on to our special guests, um, I just wanted to add under commission matters that I, I did attend the Gaming Policy Advisory Committee and um, it was a very substantive discussion. Our legislator, um, my legislator colleagues on the, on the committee um, had an opportunity to share their views, but I wanted to take time just this moment to recognize the the chair, Karen Sawyer Conrad, who is stepping down. She um, has done a great job in that committee um, and her leadership will be missed. I know that we'll be looking for um, the governor's office to help in um, attempting to replace her, but she has a superb uh, opportunity. She will be the city manager of the of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Cool job. So, and, and while we're very reluctant to say, as <clears throat> residents of the Commonwealth, how special Portsmouth is, we do know that. So it's a great job for her. But anyway, we thank her. I think John Zamba would have been thanking her today, but he's not here. So we thank her very much. So any any further questions for Commissioner Stebbins? Okay, then we'll move on to. Um, item number nine on our agenda, uh, Director Griffin. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, today we celebrate the two-year anniversary and the successes of the Northeast Center for Tradeswomen's Equity and the Build a Life That Works campaign. Um, with me today are Mary Vogel, uh, to my right, Executive Director of Building Pathways and also representing um, NCTE. Um, Kate Leon. Um, also of the Northeast Center for Tradeswomen's Equity. She's the pipeline navigator. And Savvy Francis, um, who is now a journey level pipe fitter from local 537, 537. <laughs> um, and she worked um, building on Core Boston Harbor uh, with other uh, pipe fitters. Um, so uh, the campaign, just to give you a little bit of brief background, resulted from recommendations of a six-month focus group of Access and Opportunity Committee members um, that I pulled together in um, the year 2016 to respond to the challenge that our licensees were and all large developers were facing um, regarding the supply of tradeswomen. Um, so since 2017, MGC has awarded more than uh, $200,000 in grant funding to launch and sustain this partnership, including the development of the website, branding, advertising collateral, and, and the support of um, staff. Um, so with that brief background, I'm gonna turn it over, turn the presentation over to Mary Vogel. Thank you, commissioners, for inviting us here today. Um, again, my name is Mary Vogel. I'm executive director of Building Pathways, as well as a board member and treasurer of the Northeast Center for Trades Women's Equity. 
and sort of the ex officio administrator of NCTE. Um, and uh, Commissioner Stebbins uh, referred to the requirements in the gaming legislation around having a diverse supplier uh, group perform work on that project, but the gaming legislation also set goals for women, people of color, and veterans. And women in particular um, are vastly underrepresented in the building trades. And so NCTE was created to target increasing the participation of women in the building trades. NCTE was actually officially created in 2016, and then we began our partnership with the Mass Gaming Commission to launch the first ever statewide campaign to outreach and educate women about career opportunities in the building, uh, in the building trades. And we uh, did this through a collaboration of our founding organizations for NCTE, so that would be Building Pathways, the Policy Group on Trades Women's Issues, the Building and Construction Trades of the Metropolitan District, which is basically Greater Boston Building Trades, the New England Carpenters Regional Council, and uh, the Mass AFL-CIO. So this was a consortium of organizations that have been working on this issue for quite some time. And with that uh, leadership and experience, we worked with the Gaming Commission to launch this campaign, which was funded largely by the Gaming Commission, but also several other partners, the Mass Convention Center, the Building Trades Employers Association, the Mass Con uh, Construction Advancement Program, AG's office, we've had funding from USDOL, um, the Boston Foundation and some other partners. So this has been truly a collaborative effort to increase the participation of women in the building trades. And we have approached this throughout as a supply, integrated supply demand strategy. So the demand is created by public agencies such as the Mass Gaming Commission creating these workforce hiring goals for women, people of color, and um, in this case, veterans. There are other state agencies that have these goals. The city of Boston has them. So we understand that in order to increase participation and retention of a diverse workforce, you have to have that demand side of the equation. NCTE and building pathways and similar pre-apprenticeship programs come in to make sure that we have a supply of diverse workers to fill those demands. So NCTE, through this marketing campaign, which Kate will really focus on this afternoon, and, and Savvy, um, was really focused on making sure that we have that supply, making sure that women understood that these career opportunities are available, and that women can do this work, have done this work, and will continue to do this work. So I think you know, the real crux of this was to create that visibility because frankly, if women don't see other women on the job site, they don't know these career opportunities are available to them. So that was the real thrust of this campaign. Um, you had your uh, supplier diversity meeting uh, last week, I think you said, Commissioner Stebbins. Uh, we also had a diversity summit um, in at Smith College at UMass um, in the western part of the state, really trying to create a legacy of the work that was done with the Mass Gaming Commission to talk with other developers, owners, and users about how you can create a diverse workforce on the projects that you're funding. So we had uh, academic institutions at that summit. We had healthcare institutions other anchor institutions that can really make a difference in making sure that the legacy here continues across the state. And um, so I'd like to actually, you know, thank the commission for its work in um, hosting that, that summit. And also in particular, uh, Jill Griffin, um, Elaine Driscoll, Crystal Howard, Commissioner Stebbins, who we've been working with all along on this project, and their input and support has, has been invaluable and really necessary. And um, so thank you. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kate, who will talk more particularly about the components of our Build a Life campaign. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mary. Thank you, Jill. And thank you, commissioners. Um, we're also excited to be here today to celebrate our two-year anniversary with CAKE 
And so <laughs> um, let's get to it. So as Mary mentioned, the Build a Life That Works campaign is, um, was founded by a coalition of partners, um, which she listed, but the Mass Gaming Commission has been uh, a major partner along with the Boston Building Trades, the Mass AFL-CIO, and the uh, North Atlantic States Council of Carpenters, which is a new name for the New England uh, Carpenters. And um, this is an important work that we're doing um, because it is getting uh, women um, into great careers. The building trades offer great careers for anyone, regardless of gender. We know they have great wages, they have great benefits, paid training, um, but women don't always have access. So, Savvy, could you tell us a little bit about um, your career and kind of how joining the building trades affected your life? Good afternoon. I was working in a nonprofit organization in Roxbury back in 2012. I've always knew I wanted to get into the building trades as a young child playing with my grandfather's tools. He was in the DC 35 Painters Union. And as I was working, making just $12 an hour, I was like, I need something better. So the director of the company I was at ended up sending an email blast for building pathways. So I looked at that as being my golden ticket to try to go through what I had to go through for paperwork, um, the testing, math, and everything to get my foot in the door. So I, 2012, I remember going down to the info session on Temple Street at ABCD at the time. And I sat through the info session, brought all the paperwork, made sure I made copies of it just in case if I forgot anything, studied the math packet that was given to us and I remember going to the Carpenters Training Center in Dorchester. There were so many women in that room going for the same goal as I was going for. And I just kept telling myself, I'm gonna, I have this in the bag. Then I remember September receiving the letter that I was in the, I got accepted into Building Pathways. And from there, I was just so happy because I just knew from there that's the start of everything for me. Went through it, the seven week program at the time. We went to different training facilities to decide which one we wanted to go into. And I remember at the time when I interviewed with Mary, I picked iron workers, electricians, and the bricklayers on the application for the interview part. And I just remember Mary saying, this is everywhere, like, because it wasn't all, like, with the pipe fitters, it's a pipe trade. So if I'd picked the sprinkler fitters and the plumbers, I could see where it all related to, but it was just all over the place because I was just so excited. And I knew people, I have uncles that are retired, electricians and everything. Um, and I knew people that are iron workers and bricklayers. That's the only reason why I picked those three. But being able to get hands on at the different training facilities, that's when I decided I want to be a pipe fitter instead. So I graduated in December 2012, and I remember them letting us know that the pipe fitters are accepting applications in the month of January. 2013, I, I walked down there because I went back to my old job for some sort of income. Thankfully, I was living in an apartment. My father owns a house in Dorchester. So I walked down there, filled out the application, brought everything with me, and I just remember waiting at the at my mailbox every day for the letter. I went, had an interview in April, got the phone call from the assistant business manager in June to start working the very next day, which was a Wednesday. So ever since then, I've been with the Pipe Fitters Local 537, the same company also, E.M. Duggan, um, going into my seventh year, I actually bought a house right after I graduated from my apprenticeship in May 2018. Got married in May 2019 and just had a baby a month ago. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Mm. wow. So, yeah, as you can hear, these are really um, like life changing, family sustaining careers, and it takes programs like um, Building Pathways that, um, that Savvy went through and campaigns and initiative like build a life that works to make the pathways to these careers uh, clear for women and for people of color and other groups that were traditionally under underrepresented in, in the field. 
Can I just ask? I, I think I just realized a few minutes uh, ago. Are, are you the face of the campaign? Oh, yeah. One of the faces. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. One of the of course. Faces. One of the faces. She walked in and Stay I knew right away. Right, right, right up there. I should <laughs> say I look at your face every day <laughs> <laughs> because I go through Forest Hills where your yeah your I face was at that is, job. Um, site. The job. Uh, yes. uh, the demo. Uh, She's right you, around the corner, too, on that side. You, you yeah. look very different without your helmet. <laughs> My husband actually has to look at that post every day at work. He's yeah. out of DTA, the formerly welfare, so they have a poster at his office. <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. I hope and he's she proud. has autographed one of those posters. Is that right? <laughs> Could, could I ask a question as well? Ms. Francis, so yeah. you're a journeywoman now. Yes. Could you please explain the difference between an apprentice and a journeywoman? Sure. As an apprentice, I went um, through schooling with the union. So my first year, I went two, two nights a week, and then 537 changed it for the first and second years. Now you have to go during the week. You work for six weeks, and then you go to school for a week. Then third, fourth, and fifth year, you end up going at night, and you go through tests. You have to get certified for your med gas. You can get certification for welding. I did all five years. I studied for the state exam. Then I became a journey level September of 2008. Even though I graduated in April, I got my license in September 2018, so you get a pay increase also each year from an apprentice, and then once you get a license, you get the, uh, the big bucks, as you could say, as a journey level That's person. Right. So it doesn't sound like it was easy, but you persevere. Yes, I went to school nights as a first year, and then third, fourth, and fifth year I went <coughs> nights also. Depending on what year you are, it could be three nights a week. Um, and then the nights were hard because if you had a family, which my husband has a son prior from a prior relationship, so they depended on me to make dinner after I came home from school, from working from 6 to 2 o'clock in the afternoon, then going to school from 5 to 8, and then going home, having to have homework that needed to be done for, the, for class, studying also. And then sometimes you catch it, like I would, when I was working at Encore, that's when I was in my fifth year apprenticeship, so I actually had to drive, while they were rebuilding our school, I had to drive to Norwood. So I'd leave straight from work to sleep in my car for three hours before class started. Or sometimes I would just listen to myself because I was studying for the test. So I had my phone going with my voice, saying the questions and answers for the state exam. Wow. <laughs> Great technique to study. <laughs> yes. Wow. Yeah. Um, these Savvy actually told us just earlier today um, that she had turned off her Facebook during her apprenticeship because these are uh, great careers, but they're also um, pretty rigorous and elite careers. So um, back on Facebook now that she's a journey woman. Wow. <laughs> I don't have to study for anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in addition to helping uh, women like Savvy connect with great careers, um, this initiative um, also helps the Massachusetts economy because the construction industry over and over you hear people expressing a labor shortage. Projects get delayed, et cetera. But there's a pretty, uh, say 50% of the population that um, isn't always tapped into with women. So um, there's a group over here saying we need workers and then there's a group over here which is women folks of color saying we need work, so we're working to connect those two. Mm -hmm. uh, makes sense. Mm -hmm. awesome. So how we do the connecting um, is through a couple ways. Uh, the main barriers for women and uh, getting into the uh, building trades are exposure and access. So if you, exposure means if you've never seen something, how are you gonna think to do it? If you've never seen a woman in a hard hat, you may never think of putting one on. Um, and then access, the pathways to trade careers are not always clear or people don't, um, it, it takes um, knowledge of where to go, when, and so the ways that we address the, the visibility piece is creating branded marketing assets featuring real trades women like Savvy, um, which we'll go over in detail. And the way that we address the uh, access piece was um, I worked as a pipeline navigator telling women exactly where to go, when, and what the steps were they needed to take in order to enter these careers. 
So the uh, advertising that we did, um, you can see it up here, um, but it included ads, billboards, brochures, and flyers, um, all with the same branding featuring real tradeswomen from Massachusetts. And each of these things had a really clear direction for women who actually wanted to take the next step to go to our website, and that's where all the rich information was. Savvy, you mean never change your glasses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're cool. Um, so our website is buildalifema.org, and it has um, tons of great information for women seeking careers. There's FAQs about women in construction. There's real tradeswomen stories, and tradeswomen who are already in can submit their own story to inspire other women. Um, descriptions of the different trades and a contact form which has been that's the key way that women connect with us is they go to our website they fill out that contact form once they fill out that form we're able to guide them from there we have their uh, communication info can I just add before um, Kate goes on prior to this campaign the way people found out about the opportunities one way was um, going to the Department of Labor website where there was, I think it was a 36-page PDF that lists all the different union programs, the times and days that they show up, and the different um, varying requirements. And so um, this is streamlined. It's easy. They, you can see the... Um, yeah. So the, the idea of this website is that um, someone just has, they put their contact info in and they have a single point of contact, which is me that's going to guide them through. So um, it, it makes it, if for any of the union trades, someone can come to me and I'm their go-to for any questions. Um, so a key way that we reach women in the community is through Trades Women Tuesdays, which have been a big hit. Um, Savvy, can you tell a bit about Trades Women Tuesday and how it works? Yes. So it's a panel of different tradeswomen that come together <laughs> to speak to a group of women from various areas of the city of Boston and just outside of the city. And they can ask a question to anybody on the panel if they're interested for an electrician, to be an electrician, to be a plumber, there's somebody on the panel. If there is not someone on that panel that they're interested, like we'll say maybe a sheet metal worker, there's means of ways where somebody can connect that person to contact that person that's in that trade. But it's, it's a good networking system, especially for other tradeswomen, especially like say you need a carpenter. Usually we meet right before the meetings and we exchange information. We've all become good friends where one hand washes the other as well. And some of the women actually that come to the meeting will ask us for our contact information too to find out like how do we go about on applying for the local you're in or more questions if they're scared to ask in the group at the time. So we usually stay a little bit later so they can be comfortable to pull us to the side to ask us how, how have we been treated since we've gotten in, um, how's like the child care for you, like what plans do you go through, A, Bs, and Cs for that? Um, is it, like, how do, how do you end up saving money as you're working as a tradesperson as well, too? Letting them know, make sure you pack your lunch or whatever the case may be. Um, just, just little bits of information for the women to help them get their foot through the door and just applying. I had, I had the, chance, the privilege of attending one of your tradeswomen Tuesdays out in Springfield. And um, one, it was so, it, it was inspiring to see women already in the trades talking with women considering the trades. It wasn't a big group that night. It was, a, I mean, it was a, a healthy group. And uh, one of the women had, had to bring her young child along. And obviously the child was not really interested in the conversations mom was having. But it was amazing because all the other moms and women kind of like pitched in entertaining this this kid while the conversation was going on and it just it showed how serious they all were but how they were almost <coughs> de facto you know feeling a part of a sisterhood to uh, as they got ready to to consider a job in the trades it was an incredible evening 
Well, as Savvy mentioned, one of the outcomes of conducting these Trades Women Tuesdays, in addition to informing women about the career opportunities in the building trades, is this creation of a speakers bureau. So the trades women that come to these meetings, as Savvy said, meet before the actual um, open house, gives them an opportunity to build stronger relations across the trades. But then these women also, we count on them to speak at various events. For example, our Massachusetts Girls in Trades conferences. Uh, Kate has them come to career fairs with her and other events. So it's a real opportunity to build uh, leadership skills, actually, with um, these, the trades women that participate. So we've had this unexpected but very valuable outcome as a result of this event. Mary, do you, um, or, or anybody, do you hear um, concerns from women about, you know, um, heavily, still heavily dominated male industry, uh, about what might be encountered, you know, acceptance? Uh, do, you, do you see more acceptance, um, you know, in the, late few, in the last few years? From, we certainly from see from more trade. acceptance. I think if you talk to tradeswomen who have been in the industry for some time, they've seen a sea change. There's still a long way to go. And so in addition to working on increasing the participation of women in the construction, which in itself is making that difference, we're also working on retaining women. And that comes with training. So we've done some respectful workplace training for contractors. And we're going to continue to roll out more training to make sure that all workers understand the importance of establishing and sustaining a respectful workplace that recognizes the dignity of all workers and the, the contributions that a diverse workforce can bring to um, changing the culture of the industry. So that work is being done as well. Uh, so in regard to uh, Tradeswomen <coughs> Tuesdays, yeah, they're really great for visibility of tradeswomen, um, for retention of existing tradeswomen, and we plan to continue them um, across the state into the next year. But um, we've held 45 of them so far over our first two years. Um, Savvy participated in the Boston area ones almost every month we'd see you come out. Um, and we also hold them uh, with various regions. We had one last week in Worcester, and next week is going to be Springfield Tradeswomen Tuesday, next Tuesday. And uh, two years in, we're starting to see an impact. We've had, um, to date, 1,608 women um, connect with us who are now added to our pipeline and receive communications from me and guidance. And I, we have new women reaching out over Facebook and email and all the different ways we connect every day. And they say, Kate, I'm so glad that I found Build a Life. I'm glad that I found you because um, either I've been trying to get in, but I wasn't sure of the steps, or I've been trying to get in, but I didn't have the uh, confidence to do this on my own and I needed to meet with other women. Or I never thought to do this before, but I read the, your website and it seems like these are, um, there's plenty of benefits to going this way. So that's pretty rewarding. These are both women, the over 1,600 women have either connected with us through the website alone or attending a Tradeswomen Tuesday. And then when they come to a Tradeswomen Tuesday, they actually sign into the website. So we are tracking all of the women that we're interacting with. When you talked about data collection, that's our forte right now. So. Yeah. Kate, before you go on, because I'm afraid that I won't get a chance to ask this question because of the culminating surprise, you, and I think Savvy would agree, have been so instrumental in the success of these women. And you see that, just that picture alone of color, and I'm suspecting that you were the point of contact for each of them. Can you just say a little bit of your background and how you came to this position? Sure. Um, so prior to this position, I started a pre-apprenticeship program, a uh, training program for construction in Washington, D.C. And that program actually used running as a tool for job readiness. So um, the idea was that by getting people uh, up early in the morning to run, it would uh, give them work ethic and physical fitness. Um, and so having... Uh, that background of actually running a pre-apprenticeship program let me really see that um, 
construction can be uh, great careers. That was a, a non-union program, I will say. I'll plug the union here because um, working now with union partners, I see that the the level of training that I the, like that the training that unions provide that I can direct folks towards, and then the job opportunities are really uh, top notch with the union. So. Um, that's a big difference and makes me really proud of being here and working in mass for right now. Thank you. Sure. Um, and Massachusetts right now um, just took the top spot for the percentage of women in apprenticeship. So um, we edged ahead of Oregon where they're also doing a lot of work, great work, uh, uh, to get women into the trades and retain them in the trades. And uh, we can say it's due in part to the Build a Life campaign, in large part to the demand that was created by having goals on the uh, casino projects here in Mass, and which drove the, um, the industry to bring in more workers. And we actually made history through our work with Mass Gaming. The Encore Boston Harbor build employed 491 tradeswomen, and that's the most ever on a single project. And both of the projects, the MGM Springfield and the Encore Boston Harbor, exceeded their workforce diversity goals. Mm -hmm. So we talked about the women that we've helped. Here's uh, some photos of women who um, have come through the pipeline and are now working in the field. And we'll spotlight a few. This is uh, Terrell Brown. She's now working as an iron worker, uh, an iron worker's <laughs> apprentice. And she came to a tradeswoman Tuesday, heard the presentation, uh, put in her applications, went through the pipeline, and got her start that way. And then Kim McIntosh here is a Teamsters apprentice, so a driver. That's what Teamsters do. And she found us through the Build a Life That Works website. Um, and she is um, such a rock star in her apprenticeship program right now that the president of the Teamsters Local 25 actually wrote us a short note about Kim and how well she's doing. So I'm going to share it with you guys. So he said, thank you for pointing Kim McIntosh in our direction. Your assistance with recruitment through Build a Life That Works helped Kim navigate our training program. Kim was successfully able to balance her home, work, and training responsibilities and complete the training. Upon completing her road test, Kim went to work right away in a Teamsters job, and the 12,500 members of Teamsters Local 25 will be proud to call her sister. Sean O'Brien, president of the Teamsters. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. So, way to go, Kim. <laughs> And the pipeline is growing. Every month we meet new women like Kim and Terrell who are interested in these jobs. They want to do this work. It puts down any naysayers who say women don't want to do this work. Um, and we're going to continue to do Tradeswomen Tuesdays throughout the next year in different parts of the state. And um, you can go to our website to see what the schedule is if you'd like to, if anyone's interested, like Bruce, in attending and uh, see what, what's up. Um, and one final note, and then um, open, we're all open to questions, is that um, we're growing as an organization. So as we make more and more contacts, we need more staff. So we're hiring a new pipeline navigator. Um, I'll be working as the program director. And um, if you're interested in seeing the job posting, you can contact us. So thank you. You may know Susan Moyer, who um, has yeah. worked She's worked in this area for oh, 20 years, and she's uh, semi-retired and due to retire at the end of March 2020. So Kate's going to assume a lot of uh, the work that Susan had done, and we're hiring a person to replace <laughs> Kate as the pipeline navigator. So Those are big shoes, but I'm sure you're up to that yeah. task. We're growing to a <laughs> staff of two. <laughs> <laughs> Doubling. But a lot of volunteer hands-on work, so. That's great. Congratulations. So, Savvy, you worked at Encore? Yes. Uh, yes have you been it. back to the finished product? No, not yet. <gasps> not yet. You probably have to check it out. Uh, everybody told me. And actually, where I moved, I told my husband there's actually a shuttle bus that 
leaves from the parking ride in Rockland every 30 minutes that goes yeah. there, so that way we don't have to drive. Yeah. <laughs> what, in what area? You, you, were you the a pipe fitter there already? You were, you were a, a, an apprentice, you said? I was in my uh, fifth year, yes. I was yeah. studying to get out yeah. of my time to become journey, yeah. journeyman, journey level, journey That's woman. <laughs> I just wanted to relate another comment that uh, Savvy made earlier this afternoon. She said her stepson was, you know, he's in high school, I guess a senior in high school, and looking at, you know, what he was going to do in his future, and he was considering a pipe fitter, college, or the Air Force, and he said, you know, my dad kept telling me, you got to go to college, you got to go to college, and then we're realizing that the highest breadwinner in the house is a pipe fitter, so maybe that's the way to go. He ended up enlisting in the Air Force, but uh, certainly uh, it just goes to show how uh, these, you know, how wonderful these careers can be in terms of wages and benefits and, mm -hmm. and just frankly, not just, you know, inuring to the benefit of the individual, but to the community in which they live and work, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. oh, great. Great Thank stories, you. obviously. Thank you. So interesting, Ms. Francis, that you, uh, you're studying. Your whole uh, personal life is expanding. Uh, you're, uh, you're, uh, you are an apprentice at the same time, so you're working, studying, balancing family life, and you have the time to show up on Tuesdays to mentor. So yeah. you are uh, you're to be commended, and I'm sure you've encouraged a lot of other women to... Uh, to say, I can do this too. Yes, thank you. Savvy's a rock star, literally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 good work. Great work. And commissioners, um, when we break, I'll invite you for a brief photo op with our uh, uh, cake back there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> great. great, great. Thank you. All of you, great work. Thank, thank you. you. Tremendous, making a difference. Okay. Yeah. So, Director Griffin, we're all set. Do we have any other business? I don't have an update. <clears throat> Motion we to have adjourn. cake. I know. That's the update here. Yes, that's <laughs> the update. <laughs> then I think we need a motion. I move to adjourn. Second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Thank you.